Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Life had been going smoothly. I guess it was too smooth and I should have expected something but Kelly and I had had a very good marriage. 22 years in fact. We had the usual bumps in the road but nothing major and life had turned out pretty good, at least as far as I was concerned but here's my story. Kelly and I had gone together since we met in our first week of high school and I fell head over heels in love with her. Her reddish blonde hair, her general build, her sparkling green eyes, and that killer smile she gave me indicated that she liked what she saw when she caught me looking at her most of my lunch period. I was just picking up my lunch tray to return it when she walked by with her friend and Kelly said, I hope you know it's not polite to stare. I coughed and was trying to think up a good answer, but before I could get any words out of my now parched throat, this angel said, next time, just come on over and sit down and talk with us, okay? We won't bite hard. Then they both walked to their next class giggling and looking back at me. The next day, I took her up on her offer and sat across from them and we made our introductions. Kelly Thompson and her friend Angela Melanoski. Angela was a large girl, but still very beautiful. She wasn't fat. While Kelly was 5 feet 1 inch and said she weighed 101 pounds, Angela was almost 6 and wouldn't tell us her weight. She was on the girls' wrestling and weightlifting teams. She was one hell of a lot stronger than I was and I worked out quite a bit. By the way, I'm Michael Grant, 5 feet 8 inches when I met Kelly. I warmed my way into Kelly's heart by being her friend first and by helping her parents around their house. If I went over for dinner, I'd make sure that Kelly and I would clean the table after dinner and we would do the dishes which made Mrs. Thompson pretty happy. Mr. Thompson would say, You see now, Sarah, I told you we didn't need to waste money and buy a dishwasher. Kelly got us one. He'd laugh at his joke and get another beer out of the refrigerator and plunk himself down in his recliner in front of the TV. I was also pretty handy working on cars and fixed Mr. Thompson's car, saving him from having to go to a mechanic. During high school, when I wasn't studying, I was buying non-running cars and fixing and cleaning them up to sell. Some were pretty easy fixes, but others needed the engine and transmission rebuilt. My Uncle Tim helped me a lot while he was staying with us. At the time, I didn't quite understand why he was there so much, but it turned out he was often kicked out by his current girlfriend or wife for playing around with another woman. He did teach me a lot about cars though. I worked hard in school and so did Kelly. We both had goals. I wanted to be an engineer and Kelly wanted to be a surgical nurse. That meant we needed good grades and scholarships to afford college. We would study late at night quite often, her mom coming down to check on us from time to time. She never caught us doing anything because we really weren't. Kelly had only once let me get to first base before shutting down and saying that she was afraid of getting pregnant and messing up her chances of becoming a nurse. We did have some very heavy makeout sessions, and an hour or so of dry humping with her and I'd say I needed to use the bathroom and only one or two strokes and I'd be blasting off into the toilet. I had made quite a lot of money fixing up the cars that I had originally planned on using for college, but at our graduation, I knelt down before Kelly and asked her to marry me, presenting her with a four-carat diamond ring encircled by six rubies and several diamond chips. After much crying, she said yes. Then her mother came over and asked, Okay, Michael. Just when are you planning on having this wedding? I kissed Kelly's hand, the one with the ring, and said, right after our next graduation ceremony. By this time, I had grown to 6 feet 2 inches and Kelly was now 5 feet 7 inches with these perfect 36 C's that defied gravity. They not only passed the pencil test, in order for a stamp to stay there, you would have to lick it. Guess how I knew? Kelly and I had a good summer though I knew we wouldn't be seeing too much of each other once college started. Kelly's nursing college was 45 miles away, but she was still going to live at home. Her mother insisted on it. I had started at the local state college using a grant I obtained due to my grades. I had joined the Air Force ROTC at Mr. Thompson's suggestion, figuring it would look good on my resume. My first year at college went great, and I worked hard to learn each subject. When the grades were posted, I ended up with a 3.96 average. At my next ROTC meeting in early August, the lieutenant handed me an envelope and asked, I hope you will take them up on their offer. I opened the envelope and inside were all the explanations I needed. It was an invitation to come up and visit the campus up at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I asked Kelly if she wanted to go with me, but she had taken on extra classes and she said she couldn't afford to miss them. I drove up and was given the royal treatment while I was there. 
They had assigned a senior cadet, Walker, J, to me to show me around and anywhere I asked to go, he showed me, plus taking me to all the historic spots around campus. Lunch was outside with barbecued hamburgers, hot dogs, and even veggie burgers for the few that wanted them. I was surprised at the fun activities they provided for the regular students too. When the speaker sounded 1800 hours Walker guided me to the mess hall, and instead of us sitting at the rows of tables where the cadets were sitting, Walker guided me up to the head table where the commandant and his subordinates were sitting. There was a placard with my name on it next to Major General Harold P. James. He stood and welcomed me and told me to sit. As I did, I asked, Sir, does every prospect get to sit with you at the head table? His smile filled his face and he said, Son, you sure speak your mind, don't you? Art said you'd be a good fit here, and I'm taking a liking to you already. He called me this morning and said he's known you for years, and that if the Air Force didn't take you under our wing, we'd be the biggest asses since president. Well, never mind. I looked at him because I didn't know any art. Sir, excuse me, sir. Who is this art person you are talking about? The general chuckled and nudged one of the men on his other side before asking me, You mean you don't know your girlfriend's father's first name? I swallowed hard and managed to get out. Mr. Thompson? The general slapped me on the back and said, That's him, son. Old Art Thompson. One of the craziest airmen I've ever known. If we wanted a party, that man would disappear from base and come back with a case of booze for us. No questions asked. If we needed parts for our planes, Art could come up with them. Don't ask me how but he would find out what someone had and what they needed and trade for them. I swear that man could trade a girl out of her virginity for one of my airmen before she knew it. The whole front table broke into laughter at that statement. After dinner, the general asked me to follow him to his office. We were accompanied by Walker J. and two of the general's aides. He sat behind his huge oak desk and pointed at the chair in front of his desk and had me sit in it, telling the others to sit at the overstuffed leather couch along the wall. He pushed a small stack of papers in front of me and said, Michael Grant, we here at the United States Air Force Academy would be proud to have you as one of our cadets. With the recommendations we have and your grades, I have procured a full-ride scholarship for you contingent on your continuing good grades. Son, with what I have seen so far, maintaining that should be a breeze. What do you say? Would you like to become an Air Force cadet? I was gobsmacked. I swallowed hard and finding my voice, I said, General, I do believe that your offer is the best thing that ever happened to me. But sir, I would like to talk it over with my parents and my girlfriend, Kelly, and her parents. May I give you my answer in 48 hours, sir? General James smiled and said, Mr. Grant, actually you may take up to a week, but no longer, understand? I stood and shook his hand and thanked him and was escorted by Walker J. To the barracks we shared for the night before driving home the next morning. As I stepped out of my car, Kelly ran up to me throwing her arms around my neck, kissing me deeply with tears in her eyes, and said, Michael, I'm going to miss you so much. Promise me that you won't get involved with any of those cute female cadets while you're away. It seems that Kelly already knew all about the general's offer, and I found out the general convinced her that it was really in her best interest if I accepted it. I looked at her and said somewhat surprised, I guess I don't have to tell you about their offer, do I? She smiled and said, No, Uncle Hal called last night and told us all about it. I moved to hold her at arm's length and said, Uncle Hal? Major General Harold P. James is your uncle? Kelly smiled and said, Yes, he's mother's oldest brother, stepbrother actually. His mother died giving birth to him and Grandma James is the only mother he has ever known. My mother, Sarah, being the baby of the family, became Hal's favorite. Besides, Grandma James was sick after her birth and he felt it was his duty to take care of mom. They've always been very close. Uncle Hal is the one that introduced my father to my mother. He felt that he was an honorable man and would make her a good husband for her and father for her children and he was right. Again I had trouble believing that Kelly's family and now she was planning my future but I figured I may as well roll with the punches. Being an Air Force officer wasn't that bad a gig and I'd still end up being an engineer. The only trouble was I was going to be limited in my visitations to see Kelly. That would be the real challenge. When I talked to my parents, my father, Tom, was as proud as could be but my mother, Linda, was worried that I might be sent into action. I assured her that I wasn't interested in flying, 
that I just wanted to get my engineering degree, get out, and work on computer-driven automation or power transfer stations. I called General James the next day and told him I was accepting his gracious offer. He said he was going to be watching me at Art and Kelly's request. Then he laughed. I didn't know whether he was joking or not, but I had to assume he wasn't. Soon, at the academy, the classes were going along fine as did the physical and mental training to whip us into officers. We were expected to become leaders when we graduated, and they held us to a very high standard. I was quite surprised when I was invited to a party with a bunch of cadets at one of their friends' apartment complexes one Saturday. When I got there, I'd say over half of them were running around half-dressed or naked, including the female cadets I recognized and they had taken over the pool. The party encompassed several of the apartments. This cute little blonde came up to me wearing only a green lace thong, holding a drink of some kind, and rubbed her crotch up against mine and said, You're cute. Why don't we get those clothes off and let's find us a bedroom where I can screw your brains out? I will have to admit, my tool wanted to as she was grabbing it through my pants, but then I saw another girl who reminded me so much of Kelly that guilt shot through my brain like I had been hit by lightning. I eased her away and said, I'm sorry, but I think this is the wrong type of party for me, and turned to leave. She hollered, What's the matter? Are you queer or something? A number of my fellow classmates had heard her and back at campus, I began hearing them call me Queer Boy or QB behind my back. A few weeks later, two of the seniors called me that repeatedly, even after I asked them to stop. When I walked up to them, they just laughed at me, so I decked both of them which landed me squarely in the general's office. General James sat behind his desk as I stood at attention while he was reading the charges in his hands. He shook his head and said, Michael, Michael, Michael. Hitting a superior technically is a court-martial offense. You do know that don't you? Sir, yes, sir, I responded. Looking me over hard, he said, it says here that you hit them for no reason. Is that right, son? Sir, no, sir, I answered. Care to tell me about it in your own words, and you don't have to call me sir and be formal in here. This is my office and our conversation is just between us. Got it? Sir, yes. But he stopped me before I could get out the last sir. Just between us, now tell me what's going on. He said, I didn't want to rat out my fellow cadets, but I didn't want to be court-martialed either. After shuffling my feet for a bit, I said, Well, sir, I was invited to an off-campus party a while back with a bunch of other cadets. When I got there, at least half of them were naked or only partially dressed. That included most of the female cadets too, sir. People were screwing in the pool and going in and out of several apartments. I assumed to use the bedrooms. As I stood there, this cute blonde came up to me wearing only a green lace thong and began rubbing her crotch to mine and said, You're cute. Why don't we get those clothes off of you and let's find us a bedroom where I can screw your brains out. She then grabbed my privates and tried to pull me into one of the apartments when I saw a girl that looked a lot like Kelly and I realized what I was doing and pushed this blonde away and told her I was at the wrong type of party. She said rather loudly, What's the matter? Are you queer or something? Well, sir. Several of my classmates heard her and it got back to school and people began calling me queer, queer boy, or QB behind my back and sometimes not so quietly. Those two guys were taunting me over and over and I finally had all I could take. I know it was wrong but something inside me exploded. A couple of quick jabs to their jaws and they went down like a candle flame in a hurricane. I can't say that I'm sorry sir, because I'm not. I guess I deserve the court martial. The general looked at me smiling and said, don't worry, Michael. I'll handle this one. You did a bad thing, but for the right reason. You can go now and send in those two yahoos you hit on your way out, would you? I saluted him and said, Sir, yes, sir. And thank you, sir. Then turned and headed out the door and told the general's aide he wanted to see the two upperclassmen that I had hit. They were sitting on the bench with smug looks on their face, thinking I was going to be court martialed or expelled. Two days later, there was a general assembly about sexual harassment and the proper way to report it, or even the appearance of harassment or innuendo which could cause mental issues with someone. It also covered assault and some on- and off-campus parties, which were now going to be subject to campus security checks if they were located. Also, for the next two weeks, the two upperclassmen that harassed me were in blue jumpsuits picking up garbage all over campus and cleaning the latrines instead of in their uniforms. I think everyone got the message that those two were the ones that the harassment lecture was intended for. 
Suddenly, they became shunned from all the parties. Then Christmas vacation hit, three weeks at home. I was overjoyed as Kelly's master's program had the same break. She had told me she had lots of things planned for us. We were going cross-country skiing, camping, driving up the coast, and spending three nights at a beautiful bed and breakfast overlooking the ocean. I thought to myself, I hope she ordered separate beds as I didn't know if I could control myself. Kelly's parents had gone to Phoenix to see Kelly's sister and their new grandson, so she was alone at home. Over the phone, she offered to let me stay there, but I said, I wasn't sure if the two of us could be trusted not to do something. She said she could if I could. I told her that was the problem as I wasn't sure I could. She giggled and kissed me over the phone. I was thinking about this while driving all the way home. I swear I was hard the entire trip. I figured I'd make a quick stop to see her before going to my parents. As soon as I pulled into her driveway, she ran to me wearing an almost see-through white sundress with pink and yellow daisies on it, throwing her arms around my neck and her legs around my waist. We kissed for what must have been ten minutes or more when Mrs. Wilson from next door yelled, Get a room, you two. Kelly separated herself from me, and I grabbed her hand, and we headed inside where she had dinner waiting for me. Her mother's meatloaf with mushroom brown gravy, mashed potatoes, green beans with bacon, and cheesy biscuits. Dinner was perfect. I had eaten just enough to be full but not stuffed. Kelly and I sat on her big couch in front of the TV as she turned it on in the VCR. She had put on A Miracle on 34th Street and snuggled up next to me. She said she was getting cold and wanted to change. She ran upstairs and came down with a blanket wrapped around her. As she got in front of me, she opened the blanket to show me she was wearing this sheer, white baby doll pajama top with the tiniest matching white lace thong. She climbed into my lap, straddling my legs, and began French kissing me deeply. I was instantly hard and turned on like there was no tomorrow. I broke our kiss and started to ask, Kelly, are you sure about? When she cut me off and began to unzip my jeans. She unfastened my belt then tugged at them down my legs and managed to get my pants and shoes off at the same time. She gave me B-job. Oh God. I thought. Where did she learn this? Part of me wanted to know but I knew if I asked her. She'd be pissed at me for asking because I would be implying. She was unfaithful to me but damn. She was doing it like a pro. Not that I've ever been with one before. Kelly was screaming like a banshee as orgasms hit her like a tsunami. She was yelling. Yes. Oh God, Michael, I said, Kelly, I'm about to explode. Let me pull out. We're not ready to be parents. We both have school to finish. But Kelly kept up her frantic assault, planting her lips tightly to mine and tangling her tongue with mine and I exploded. Oh my Lord. We're still on her couch, holding each other in that same position as Kelly's legs and body quivered, and I caressed her dew-laden back and pulled her sweet jugs into my chest. What had we done? This was so unlike the Kelly I had left a few months ago. Now I was really wondering if she was seeing someone else. I know it was stupid but she had gone from a shy little flower into a lust-filled vixen. Still, I loved her and was softly kissing the sweat from her neck and shoulder when she turned and looked at me. Her eyes were glazed over and she was smiling like the cat that ate the canary. Placing her finger in my mouth, she asked, Did you like my present, my love? That was one hell of a present. What in the world did I do to deserve that? Aren't you worried that you will get pregnant? You know that would throw a monkey wrench into our schooling plans. I said. Kelly leaned back with me holding her with my arms to keep her from falling and said, Michael dearest, first off, last month I talked with one of the doctors and he prescribed birth control pills for me. Second is the reason for that was that Uncle Hal called and told me how you turned down an almost naked blonde that was trying to pull you by your manhood into a bedroom to have wild sex with you. And you told her no, you wouldn't do it. You were thinking of me and knew that I wouldn't condone you cheating on me if I ever found out. I decided to give you a very special welcome home gift and talked with several other nurses and they gave me ideas on how to pleasure you. So tell me, did I do a good job? It looked like you were enjoying it. Hell, Michael. I know I sure did. When I described your size to them, several of them said that if we didn't get married, they wanted your phone number. I didn't know whether to be proud of you or pissed at them. I pulled her to me and gave her a very deep kiss. I was loving bring her off like this. Having come twice, we had just made out for a while until sleep overtook us for a few hours. The noise of traffic and somebody's lawnmower woke us up. This was Southern California, you know. 
She got up first and came back with an electric toothbrush in her mouth with one hand working it and a regular toothbrush for me. After getting rid of the grunge, we rinsed and somehow ended up having sex, where we found the peppermint toothpaste gave an extra zing to our play. Kelly told me to be sure to remember that for our wedding night. After we gave each other mutual orgasms, I lay on my back as she got out of bed and said, I'm going to get breakfast started. You just lay there and relax and build up your strength. Then with a big grin, she said, You're going to need it, mister. Then ran out of the bedroom. I lay there for a few minutes then smelled that delicious odor of bacon cooking. I threw on my pants and ran to the car to get my ditty bag. Then, shaved, washed up, and used deodorant. I threw on a t-shirt, liquor running shorts, and my running shoes. As I stepped into the kitchen, I had to stop and take in the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. Kelly was standing at the stove, wearing her mother's apron with nothing else on. It just covered from her jugs to just above her knees. Sarah's pretty short by the way, but what a sweetheart. I walked over to the coffee maker and poured myself a cup of coffee. Kelly heard me and said, You know where the sugar and cream are so help yourself? Don't use them anymore, I said as I lightly slapped her cute bum, then rubbed it tenderly. I'm making corn cakes and maple bacon for breakfast. Is that okay with you? I sat down at the table where she had already sat the morning's paper and was having trouble reading it with Kelly bobbing around in front of me. I was finding the licra stretching in my crotch as I watched her. I got up and poured myself another cup and had sat back down when Kelly opened the oven and brought out a plate piled high with crisp bacon and another with a huge stack of corn cakes that she knows I love. Sarah, her mother, makes them for me as she knows I love them. They're regular pancakes with creamed corn in the batter. Kelly only ate one in one piece of bacon. When I asked her why, she said, because I don't want all that food lugging me down when I race you through the park and back to see who gets to decide what we're going to do tonight. Shit, I'd already eaten six corn cakes and at least ten pieces of bacon. I helped Kelly clean up the kitchen and tidied up the place before we headed out. We had decided to take an easy jog to Starbucks first and after a morning caffeine fix, we would race around the park and back to her house. Besides, I needed to keep in shape for my classes. Instead of going back to her house, Kelly wanted to stop and see my parents. Dad wasn't home but Mom was in the living room folding clothes. She smiled when she saw us walk in, then admonished me for not coming home last night. Michael, what are the neighbors going to think about you spending the night at Kelly's house with her parents not home? You are going to ruin her reputation. You know that, don't you? She said. Before I could answer, Kelly said, Don't worry Linda, Michael stayed downstairs last night. He was the perfect gentleman, smiling like a Cheshire cat. God, I hoped my mother didn't notice the way she accentuated perfect. Mom looked at her sternly then said, Oh, so it's Linda you're calling me now instead of Mrs. Grant, is it? Kelly took half a step back and trying to formulate a good answer said, Well, Mrs. Grant, I thought we should be on a first name basis since soon I will also be Mrs. Grant. Though she said it quite apologetically. Mom got off the couch and Kelly stepped back. Then Mom smiled and threw her arms around Kelly giving her a big hug and said, Can't I tease my son's beautiful future bride? But really, I think it would be better if you spent the night here until your parents get home tomorrow. I know how much temptation being home alone can cause and right now, you two don't need any problems. Kelly, you still have two and a half years and your master's program finishes and Michael has a year and a half before he graduates then four years until he fulfills his tour of duty unless he re-enlists. How about if we plan your wedding for the week he graduates from the academy? Kelly's eyes got really big and the smile on her face said it all. She jumped into my mother's arms and hugged her so hard mom had to stop her to get her breath. Kelly turned to me and said, Michael, what do you think of that idea? I think it would be wonderful. You said when mom asked you when we would get married and you said at the next graduation, that is unless you would rather hold it at my graduation? Kelly came to me, putting her arms around my neck and pulling me down so we could kiss. I was now 6 feet 5 inches to her 5 feet 8 inches and we were so much in love it didn't matter. On the day of Kelly's parents' return, Kelly and I had gone for a run. We decided to hit a wilderness trail up through Silverado Canyon for something different to challenge us. We had made a hard run up this long uphill trail to a beautiful viewpoint and stopped for a drink of water. Kelly looked around and said, Michael, do you see anybody? 
I looked in all directions and shook my head no. Kelly whipped off her top, pulled down her running shorts, and yanked my top over my head, throwing it down on a flat rock and laid down on it, spreading her legs and said, Michael, are you going to just stand there, or are you going to take me up on my invitation? She didn't have to ask me twice. It wasn't the most comfortable place to make love, but it did make it difficult for me to orgasm which gave Kelly multiple orgasms. After about 30 minutes she asked, Michael are you going to explode? Kelly, honestly babe, this isn't the most comfortable position to be in to try to orgasm. I found myself letting out a loud, primal scream that echoed through the canyons below. Someone below yelled back. Sounds like someone's having fun. Kelly got embarrassed and she quickly dressed. My top was caked with mud, so I had to carry it, and we made our way back to my car and headed towards home, both with big smiles on our faces. I had managed to stop and find a faucet to wash my top off. When we got to my house, my mom said that Kelly's parents had called and asked if we could come to their house as my mom had talked with Sarah about the possible marriage when I graduated. Kelly and I decided to run just for the fun of it, and we entered the house, giggling about our mountaintop fun. I sat down at the kitchen table while Kelly grabbed two bottles of water then sat next to me. Sarah walked in and froze. She then sat down opposite us and was tapping her fingers on the table then said, Okay, you too. How long? How long what, mom? Kelly asked. How long have you two been screwing Kelly James Thompson? She said, very pissed. What do you mean, mom? What makes you think that Michael and I have been having sex? Her mother looked at the two of us and said, because the two of you have the same look that your father and I had when we were having sex just before we got married. I'm not that old that I don't remember the feeling. I was just lucky that he was using condoms. Harold told him that if he got me pregnant before he married me that he would end up being one of the dummies on the live fire exercises on the firing range. But you two sure look like you're having sex, now are you? Mom, that's really none of your business. I'm an adult and you shouldn't treat me like a child. Kelly threw back at her mother. Sarah sighed and said, Kelly, my darling, I should have had this talk with you long before this, but I figured there would be time. I guess I only have myself to blame. Are you two using condoms? Kelly finally shook her head no, looking down at the table, not at her mother as she held my hand tightly. Sarah asked, so I guess you were on birth control pills? Kelly nodded yes. Her mother rolled her eyes and her head leaned back, then she leaned forward and leaned over to Kelly and taking her hand she said, My sweet darling, us James women, well most of us, have problems with birth control pills working for us. I was on birth control pills when your sister was conceived as well as you. Your poor father had to use condoms if he wanted sex, or I had to try to give him bee jobs, which I never was very good at. I don't know how long you two have been intimate but from now on, you need to use condoms, understood. Sarah was looking directly at me when she said that. Also, you had better get a couple of pregnancy tests and take one now, another in about a week then one more in another week. Michael probably has strong swimmers, and they may last a while. We sat there in shock, holding each other's hands tightly. For the first time since I had known Kelly, she looked scared. Tears were starting to run down her cheeks. I pulled her tight and held her, then whispered in her ear, Sweetheart, we will find a way to get through this. Maybe you're not pregnant. Apparently, that wasn't the right thing to say as she began sobbing hysterically, pressing her head tightly to my chest. Sarah got up and walked around behind us and held us in her arms, kissing Kelly but shaking her head. Again she said, Kids, I'm really sorry I didn't say something sooner. I just thought there would be more time I guess. Sarah took Kelly up to her bedroom and I ran home, changed into some jeans and a polo shirt, and headed to the pharmacy and picked up several pregnancy tests and a box of condoms. Boy did I get a funny look from the girl at the check stand. I think we went to school together, and here I was picking up this combination of items. I quickly drove over to Kelly's and handed the bag to her mom and asked where Kelly was. She's up in her room sleeping. When she wakes up, I'll make sure she takes one. We will let you know what the results are. The next morning, Kelly called. She sounded like she had been crying and said, Michael, it looks like you're going to be a father. My parents want you to bring your parents over. We all need to talk. Hell, what was I going to tell my parents? Shit, shit, shit. I said to myself, banging my head against my bedroom wall. Mom, hearing the banging noise, opened my door to see me squeezing the phone in one hand and my head against the wall and asked, 
Michael, what's wrong? Please tell me. I stood and looked at the ceiling and she walked over to me and raised her arms and placed her hands up on my shoulders, then pulled my head down so she could look at me face to face. Michael Grant, I'm your mother. I gave birth to you. I love you. You can tell me anything and I will always be here for you. Do you understand that? I felt so bad that I was going to disappoint them and a few tears were leaking down my cheeks so mom wiped them away and just looked up at me, waiting for me to say something. Mustering up the strength, I took a deep breath and said, Mom, er, well, um, I guess you are going to be called Grandma soon. Her jaw dropped open and she looked at me for a minute then said, Kelly, I hope? I nodded. She was shaking her head then said, I warned you too, didn't I? You two were playing with fire, but now we're going to have to make the best of it. How far along is she? She can't be far along. The first time we had sex was the night I got home which was only 10 days ago. I hadn't planned on anything happening as we were planning on saving ourselves for our honeymoon, but Kelly had found out that a female cadet had tried to seduce me and I turned her down so she decided to reward me and went on the pill and got some advice from her co-workers on how to treat their men and I had only planned on stopping by her house to let her know I was back then coming back here to you guys. She had made me dinner then put on a movie while we sat on the couch and watched it and Things just sort of happened. Ten days, Mom shouted. Michael, are you sure it's yours? How do you know she wasn't fooling around with someone else before you got home? Now I was getting upset with my mother and went on the defensive. Mom, Kelly's not that type of girl. That night, we took each other's virginity. I could tell it was her first time and I know damn well it is mine. How could you even think such a thing? Standing there with her hands on her hips, she said, Because Michael, you said she was on the pill and yet, somehow she became pregnant. That doesn't add up, does it? Mom, yesterday when we came back from our run, well, we, um, that is, we had sex during our run then when we went over to Kelly's house and her mother saw us when we came in and knew from the way we looked that we had been having sex. She then asked Kelly if we had been using condoms, and Kelly told her she was on the pill. Her mom kind of went off, then once she calmed down explained that she had failed to tell Kelly that birth control pills don't usually work for the women in her family, hormones, or something. Look, mom, her parents want all of us to come over now, so we can talk about this situation. Where is dad? I need to go break the news to him, unless you would rather do it for me? Please. I said. Mom gave me her fed up with me look and said, oh no mister, that's one talk that you're going to have to tell your father all on your own. He's out in the garage working on the mower. You go tell him the news and tell him I said he needs to come in, shower, and put on clean clothes so we can go over to the Thompsons for this lovely talk. Oh, Michael, this is going to be hard on your father. Please be gentle with him. She turned, pulling me out of my room, and sort of pushed me in the direction of the garage before heading towards their room. This was one talk with my father I wasn't looking forward to. I got to the garage door and I heard my father gritching at the mower because he couldn't get it back together properly. I stepped in and watched him for a bit until he realized someone was watching him then looked up at me then said, What's the matter Mikey boy? You look like you lost your best friend. You and Kelly have an argument? With my lips quivering, it took all my strength to say the words that I thought would kill my father. Dad, Kelly's pregnant. His eyes lit up, he jumped up, hugging me and twirling me around chanting, I'm going to be a grandpa. I'm going to be a grandpa. He stopped then said, Oh son, it's going to be difficult for you two for a while but I'm sure you two can make it. I've seen the love you two have for each other and she's such a wonderful girl. I can't wait to have a little one that I can take fishing, to teach baseball too, or if it's a little girl, have tea parties or take her shopping for dresses and dollhouses. Have you told your mother yet? I nodded. Was she as excited as I am? Not really, Dad. I said, she doesn't think the baby is mine, but I know Kelly isn't that type of girl. By the way, we need to go over to the Thompsons and talk about this situation, and Mom said to get in there and clean up and put on clean clothes so we can go over there. He was off like a shot. In the Thompsons' front room the six of us sat, Mom and Dad on the love seat, Art and Sarah on their couch, and Kelly and I sitting next to each other on chairs near both of them. Art stood as he started the conversation. Let's not beat around the bush here. These two need to get married. I'm not having a grandchild born out of wedlock. Don't you two agree? He said pointing to my parents. They both told them they agreed with him. Good, and I hope you two are willing to go along with this. 
he said looking at us. We held hands and both nodded. Good. I've called in some favors and we're going down to City Hall today and get you to your marriage license and Friday evening Judge Bartholomew will be here to marry you too. You need to get your best man and maid of honor lined up and if you'd like, a few of your friends, but I'd rather keep it on the down low. Any questions? My father spoke up. Friday is New Year's Eve. Won't that be rushing things a bit? Art smiled and said, Well, Kelly has to go back to school on Monday, and she said that Michael leaves for Colorado on Tuesday, so that's not really rushing it now, is it? Besides with that date for an anniversary, they will hardly ever forget if, will they? Judge Bartholomew has pulled some strings and gotten their marriage license backdated to a week before last so that they can get married on Friday. He understands the situation and is glad to help out. He really is a good friend. My mother spoke up saying, But Kelly is only what, 10 or 11 days pregnant, isn't she? Are you really sure she's pregnant? Shouldn't we wait and see and check with a doctor before rushing onto this marriage head first? What if the baby... I was shaking my head no at her before she said what I knew she was going to say. She wanted a paternity test, but I knew Kelly and trusted her implicitly. Sarah looked at my mom and said, What did you mean, what if the baby? Mom just shook her head and told her never mind. We went with our parents and picked up our marriage license in Judge Bartholomew's chambers, and on Friday, we were married in Art and Sarah's living room. We didn't have any friends other than my best friend Paul who was my best man and Kelly's sister who flew in to be her matron of honor. General James was also there, and it was hard to read him. I wasn't sure if he was pleased with me or pissed off at me. He really didn't talk to me much, but he did talk a lot to Kelly and her parents. We were treated to a weekend stay at the Marriott Honeymoon Suite by our parents, but saying goodbye to Kelly on Sunday evening was so very difficult that I cried after she left. Back at the academy, I poured myself into my studies. It helped me not think about Kelly and our baby. Kelly was busy working on her master's program and theses, so she seldom emailed me. Every once in a while, mom's emails would question the paternity of the baby and I'd always assure her it was mine. Kelly wouldn't send me any pictures of her because she said she was fat. She wouldn't even see me if we had similar times off which hurt. My mother questioned if she was seeing someone else, maybe the baby's true father. The last time she said it, I yelled, Stop it, mother. You don't know a goddamn thing about how much Kelly and I love each other. She jumped in fear. It was the first time I had ever yelled at my mother. I didn't come home when I had breaks after that, at least that year. I did get time off and drive to Kelly's school on her last day for the school year and wait for her at her last class. When she walked out, she looked radiant and more beautiful than ever. Then I saw this dude come up and put his arm in her arm and start a walk with her. I became instantly pissed and quick marched towards them. He noticed me first and dropped her arm and made an immediate about face when I yelled, Hey dude, get your bum back here now. Don't make me chase you. Kelly turned to see me and got this big smile and ran to me, her little belly bump poking out from her sweater. She threw her arms around my neck and kissed me hard but I kept looking for the guy who was holding Kelly's arm. Breaking our kiss, I held her at arm's length and firmly asked, Okay, Kelly, just who is that guy that seemed to be way too familiar with you when you came out of class? Be honest because I'm going to find out before I leave. She smiled and said, Oh, that's just Josh. He's another nurse. He's harmless really, just a good friend. We talk and he walks me back to my dorm. I feel safer if he walks me than if I walk alone. Since when did you start staying on campus? I thought you were driving home every day? I asked. She hooked her arm in mine and pulled me towards the dorms while saying, Michael, with the baby, it was getting to be such a chore to drive every day so daddy sprang for a dorm room for me so I didn't have to drive during the week and he or mom will come up on Friday and pick me up then drop me off on Sunday night or Monday morning, depending on my class schedule. My counselor and instructors have been very considerate about my condition. Then she stopped in front of me and began to bounce up and down saying, Guess what? Guess what? She was so cute. I had to ask, Okay, sweetness. I'll give. What's your secret? With a smile as big as Texas, she said, Next month, Dr. Gwen will do an ultrasound on me, and we will get to find out the sex of our baby. Tell me, what do you want? A boy or a girl? I pulled her in and kissed her and said, My love, as long as it's healthy, I really don't care. I will love him or her until my dying day. When we got to her room, her mother was there, 
and boy did I get a cold reception. I tried to give her a kiss on the cheek, but she turned away from me and went to help Kelly pack. I guess I knew where I stood. I went back to my car and headed back to the academy. My studies were going well, though my thoughts were really focused on Kelly and our child. Then Kelly sent me an email with a picture of the ultrasound with the caption, Can you see it? To be honest, all I saw was the outline of a baby with a bunch of squiggles and shadows. So I blew up and printed it out. I took it to the infirmary and asked the medic if he could interpret it for me, and he and I took it to the doc. Doc smiled and said, See this? It still looked just like a shadow to me, and I shrugged my shoulders and he said, Is this your child? I smiled and nodded. He stuck out his hand and he said, Well then, congratulations. It looks like you have an airman about to join this world. Are you ready to be a father? The next thing I knew, he and an orderly had me in a chair and were waving smelling salts under my nose. I felt so embarrassed and jolted out of the chair. Sir, I'm sorry, sir. I've never done that before, sir. He smiled and said, What found out you were going to be a father or fainted? Shaking the cobwebs out of my head, I said, Sir, finding out we were having a son and fainting, sir. Doc looked at my records and said, Mr. Grant, your records don't show that you are married. Are you or are you going to wait until the baby is born? If you are married, you should have reported that to the commandant and the records office. Sir, I didn't realize I needed to report it to the records office, but the general was at our wedding. My wife Kelly is his niece. I told him. He lowered his classes and gave me the look and said, You married the general's niece. Was she pregnant when you got married? I hung my head and nodded. Shaking his head, he said, Son, you really like playing with dynamite, don't you? Hell, son, you might find yourself stationed in Antarctica or most likely Isleson Air Force Base or Clear Air Force Station, both in Alaska, hidden away from everyone until your tour is up. You really screw the pooch? My gut told me he could be right. It was the 12th of October and I was on the firing range. It seems I had a natural affinity for hitting targets with my weapons, both pistol and rifle. The range instructor had kept moving me to positions where the targets were further and further away, and I kept putting them dead center though at first it took me a shot or two to get my distance and windage right but after that, I was dead on. I had just finished laying down a series of rounds at 1,000 meters when my cell phone went off with a picture of Kelly holding our new son. The caption was, what should we name him? I let out a yell that could be heard at the end of the obstacle course which brought a few officers to see what was all the commotion was about. Showing them the picture on my phone brought a bunch of slaps on the back and congratulations, and the range instructor told me to head to my barracks as I had done well, and he needed to send in a report on me. I had been giving a lot of thought about a name for our son and I called Kelly and was very surprised when she answered. After telling her how much I loved her and our new son, I said, My love, what would you think if we named him James Hal Grant after your uncle? Kelly started to say something but stopped mid-sentence and said, Michael, that's one of the reasons I love you so much. Do you have any idea how much my mother will love that name? Not to mention Uncle Hal. When do you think you can get home to see your son and me? I'm sorry I've been standoffish, but mother thinks that maybe you didn't turn that girl down or have been seeing another girl while you have been away. Boy, I was really hating my mother-in-law about now. I said, Kelly, you were acting so funny that I thought you might be seeing someone else and when I saw you walking arm in arm with that dude, it just about made me explode. I love you so much and losing you would be the worst thing that could ever happen to me. I know your feelings about cheating and would never do that to you because I value our relationship so much. Do you realize that? I could hear Kelly sniffle and I told her I never meant for her to cry and I loved her and would go see the general as soon as possible. I asked her to email me the picture she sent in a text of her holding James so I could take it to the general. She said she would and in less than a minute, I heard my computer ding that I had a new email. I opened my messages and there was the picture I needed. I used a photo editing program and added words to the picture. October 12, 99 announcing the arrival of our future airman, James Hal Grant, born to Michael and Kelly Grant. I then printed out several copies and ran to the general's office. His aide stopped me and at first told me that the general was busy. I told him that his niece had just delivered a baby boy and showed him the picture. He got a big smile and said, I'll tell him it's a special delivery. I hope he doesn't kick my bum. You know you pissed him off, don't you? 
I nodded. He opened the door, hollered, special delivery, and I quick-timed up to his desk, saluted, and when he saw me, he jumped up and yelled, Just what the Sam Hill do you think you are doing here? I then handed him one of the pictures without saying a word. He started to throw it away without looking at it, but then something caught his attention. He took a long look at it, then fell back into his chair. His chin quivered and a tear slid down his cheek. Then he held the picture to his chest with his eyes closed for several minutes. When he opened his eyes, he said, I suppose you are here to ask for some time off to go see your new son, aren't you? Taking a deep breath, I said, Sir, I can't expect anything from you. I know you don't approve of our actions, but we really do love each other and had planned on getting married when I graduate in June. When you called and told Kelly about me turning down that girl, she decided to, well, reward me by having sex with me. She had gotten on birth control pills, but her mother never told her that the women in your family had issues with them not working for them. Sir, I tried to stop when I felt I was going to explode, but Kelly wouldn't let me and, well, now we have James, your namesake. Sir, the general chuckled and said, sounds like the James women. Art told me something similar as did my other brother-in-law, Chuck. When those women want it, they go after it. I guess I should have talked to you before I got in such a huff. He then picked up his phone and I heard him talking to someone. He said, Jim, file a flight plan to Edwards ASAP wheels up within an hour. I'm bringing a cadet with me. Yes, I know, just do it. I'll explain later. Thanks again. The general turned to me and said, Michael, go pack quickly as our flight leaves within the hour. Meet me on the tarmac in 45 minutes. We've got a new baby to go see. I ran to my barracks and threw some clothes in my ditty bag and caught a ride to the runway. On the way, I realized that I didn't know which plane the general was taking. Once we got there, there was this glistening Cessna jet warming its engines as the fuel truck was pulling away. I walked over and saluted the pilot. He looked at me then asked, Are you the general's guest? Sir, yes, sir. I answered. He shook his head and asked, so what's so special about you that the general is breaking protocol to take you to Edwards AFB on such short notice? Did you catch him screwing one of his aides or something? Sir, what are you talking about? I asked. Well, son, it's just that the general has been single as far back as anyone can tell, and he never has shown any interest in women that anyone has ever seen so the rumor is that he might be gay, he said. Hardly, I said. The general has several ladies he keeps on the down low. He just never wants to get involved in a long-term relationship with a woman. When he was in Iraq, his beautiful wife was screwing one of his fellow officers on the base, and almost everyone knew it, even the commanding officer, but no one said anything to him. The guy knocked her up just before the general got wounded, and then was sent to Germany to be patched up. The witch was notified that he would be flying home within a week, and she and the officer took off for the hills, taking the general's two young daughters with them. He was never able to find them. That officer went AWOL, and the general is still hoping that he slips up one day and gets caught so he can find out where his daughters are. Just then I spotted the big Chrysler with the two star flags flying on the fenders heading this way. I told the captain, better get in the cockpit. Here he comes now, and it looks like he's ready to go. I followed him up the steps and stored my bag, and cover then took a seat across from what I assumed was the general's seat as it was larger and had several computers around it. The general flew in and saw me sitting there and smiled. Then surprisingly, he headed into the cockpit. Two of his aides came in with luggage and quickly stored them and found seats and buckled in followed by the two guards. One guard went to the back of the plane while the other closed the steps. He took a seat near the entrance and hollered, All secured and seated, sir. I heard the engines picking up their wine as we began to roll forward, faster and faster, and when we turned onto the approach, I thought we might turn over. We were going so fast, but as soon as we were straight with the runway, it was full power and we shot into the sky. The night sky over Denver was something to behold. I was so focused on trying to locate the places I had visited that I didn't realize that I was being called until one of the aides shook my shoulder. Hey, Grant, he said, didn't you hear the general over the intercom? He wants you up in the cockpit. I couldn't for the life of me figure out what he wanted me up there for, but I unbuckled and quickly went. As I entered, I had to squeeze past the captain, and he smiled at me. The general was in the left seat, flying the plane, and he motioned me to sit in the co-pilot seat. I sat down and buckled in. 
General James then said, Go ahead, cadet, take over, son. Now I had never flown an airplane or even been in a cockpit before. I grabbed the wheel and put my feet on the pedals like the general had had his. I was trying to hold the plane as steady as I could, but the general said, Come on, Michael. It's time you showed me what you got. And with that, he grabbed my left hand and yanked it down almost to my knee as he pushed it forward. The airplane's nose dove towards the earth, making a sharp turn to the left. I pulled the steering wheel, I was later corrected to call it the stick, back, and to the right, and got the plane at least heading level again. The general said, Son, did you happen to notice what altitude we were flying at before we had that little interruption? That could have been a wind shear, you know. Sir, no sir. I answered. I looked at all the gauges then asked, Sir, which one shows me how high we are? The general laughed and pointed it out. He then took his time to point out all of the gauges and told me what each one was for. He also showed me how the controls worked and gave me some flight instructions. He had me play with the controls and get familiar with them. All too soon, I heard the general talking to the Edwards Tower and getting landing permission and instructions. The general showed me how to set the flaps and to figure in the crosswind. You know, this was pretty cool. As soon as we hit the ground and were parked, the general and I were ushered into a waiting Cadillac limo and we rushed to the hospital where Kelly was. This security guard stood as we entered and the general barked, Sit down, son. We know where we're going. He backed away looking at the two armed guards behind us and we headed to the elevator and up to the seventh floor where he led me to room 714, which was filled with flowers and balloons. When I walked in, Kelly was feeding our son and her eyes lit up like lighthouse beacons. She started crying and said, Michael, I can't believe you're here. I rushed to her and we kissed, then she said, Careful, you don't want to crush your son, do you? She pulled him from her breast, handing him to me, and I saw his cute little face, and he looked so much like my baby pictures. I knew my mother couldn't deny that I was his father now. General James was on Kelly's other side, and gently brushing her face with his hand, and whispered something into her ear. She pulled him down and kissed him on the cheek which he returned. I felt like I was walking on air. I walked around the bed and asked, General, sir, would you like to hold James? He looked down at the tiny infant and took him in his large hands so carefully, it was like he was afraid he was going to break him. Kelly smiled at him and said, Uncle Hal, you can hold him, don't be afraid. You're not going to hurt him. After carefully taking him from me, the general moved over to the chair by the window and sat down and opened the blanket in our son's diaper. Then looking over at us, he said with pride, Yep. I sure can see he's a James, all right? I guess he was referring to his mail equipment. I walked over to take a look and thought he took after me but kept quiet. The general refastened the diaper and I went back to Kelly and we kissed as I held her. It wasn't but a few minutes later when both of our mothers walked into the room and as Sarah, Kelly's mother tried to take little James from the general, he admonished her and said, Sorry sis, you will have lots of time with this little bundle of joy. We're going to have to head back in the morning. Kelly sat upright and she almost cried, Uncle Hal, can't you two at least stay a few days? Please, pretty, pretty please. As he rocked little James, he said, Kelly, I really wish I could, but I have an afternoon appointment with Senator Perkins tomorrow and he is another one that is on the Appropriations Committee. He said it was very important we meet. My intel says he's trying to get his son into the academy, but the lad has been kicked out of four colleges already for his poor grades and alcohol and drug use. I don't know what he expects out of us, we're not a rehab facility. I guess we could put him in the brig for his first semester, just to get his attention and clean him up. Everyone laughed at that. Kelly asked, could Michael stay? Maybe until Sunday? The general pursed his lips in thought. The room was silent for what seemed an eternity then he said, you know, I really could use some more time in the pilot seat. Michael, report to Edwards on Sunday, 0900 sharp. That's an order. I rushed over and hugged him, which caught him off guard. Though flustered at first, he eventually put his arm around me, returning the hug. The next three days seemed to fly by, getting Kelly and James out of the hospital and moved into her old bedroom at her parents' home. They had set up a lovely nursery for him decorated for a little boy and my mom and dad were there as much as possible. Mom almost always brought food along so my mother-in-law didn't seem to mind. Everything was wonderful but it wasn't until Saturday afternoon that it changed. 
I went up to James' room to check on him when I caught my mother using Q-tips to swab his mouth that I became incensed with her. I went to grab the baggie she put them in but she stuck them in the pocket of her skirt before I could. I was about to yell when she put her fingers to her lips and mouth. Michael, I have to know. I turned and stormed out of his room. Kelly could see that I was upset and asked what was wrong. Nothing. I snapped back at her. She came up and held me and looked into my eyes questioning me so I said, Sorry, honey. It's just that I'm going to hate to leave you and our son. I don't know when I'm going to be able to see you again. Damn, I hated lying to her. She pulled me in for a smoking hot kiss which was broke by her father coughing behind us. The flight back was a lot more fun. I was getting better as the general was explaining more of the controls to me, and I was getting the hang of flying. As we neared the academy, he asked, So now do you think you might like to become a pilot? I thought for a second then said, Sir, yes sir. Just a regular pilot, not a fighter pilot though. I really could see me being your chauffeur. He belly laughed at that. The general took over the landing but I was watching closely as he followed the tower's instructions and set the flaps, then engine speed and flared out and set us down gently onto the runway. Soon I was enrolled in flight school and my senior year passed in a flash. I did manage to get home for Thanksgiving and Christmas and was amazed at how big James had gotten each time I was there. I was able to take off for Kelly's graduation and she and James came up with my parents for mine. My mother was smiling like a Cheshire cat and I asked her what was up. She whispered to me, Just so you know, son, James is yours. I am so relieved. I told her, Don't you ever tell Kelly what you did or so help me mother. You will never see James again. She gave me a look of terror and I said, Mother, I mean it. You really overstepped your bounds this time. We went out for dinner to celebrate though it wasn't as joyous as it could have been. I was also continuing my flight school and sniper training plus more engineering schooling which kept me busy nearly 12 hours a day. I missed Thanksgiving but by Christmas, I had gotten my multiple engine flight license and was close to getting my jet certification. I had finished my sniper training and my engineering degree so I was expecting to be deployed to a base soon. Then they sent me on a couple of overseas missions which I'm not supposed to talk about but I was the sharpshooter for intel groups. It was cool once while in a South American country, as a group of soldiers came marching up this mountain road towards our position, led by an officer sitting up high in the back of a jeep, that I shot off his left epaulette to get his attention. He immediately turned the group around and went back down the mountain. I also went to the Middle East a couple of times and took out designated targets, but I was never able to tell Kelly about it as these were all classified missions. Imagine my surprise when I received an email telling me that I had six weeks leave coming from the middle of December to the 1st of February and then was to report to Edwards as my new duty station. I was also eligible for base housing if I wanted for Kelly, James, and me. I called her as soon as I read the email and told her the good news. Kelly was still taking classes to become a surgical nurse but at a local college so that wasn't going to be a problem. I called and made reservations for three days at the Hilton for the honeymoon suite for us, starting the day I got back as a surprise for Kelly. She was surprised and very enthusiastic and arranged for her mother to watch James, who by now was walking and getting into everything. Let me say that we tore up those sheets like crazy. Several times, Kelly went to the door to let room service and just holding a towel or sheet around her gorgeous form, much to the bellboy's delight, and usually, they would forego their tip. She would usually have it tucked into the cloth hanging out above her jugs. Sometimes, a lot of her thigh was on display. She was such a tease for those young men. Once we had a young woman delivering our breakfast, and she didn't seem like she wanted to leave. She pushed the cart in and made sure to serve up our plates while never breaking eye contact with Kelly. When she finally asked if we wanted or needed anything else and I said no, that's all and gave her a $20 bill. She left but before we got a bite to eat, Kelly threw me back on the bed and used her mouth to get me hard then mounted me, orgasming very hard. Kelly had an IUD put in so we didn't have to worry about pregnancy, or so we thought. Not quite two years later, during a very vigorous lovemaking session, I guess we knocked the damn thing loose or maybe it just didn't work. Nine months later, Alicia was born. Kelly had a very rough delivery this time and without asking me, told her doctor to tie her tubes. I didn't find out until almost a year later when she was talking with her friend at a party, pretty blitzed and didn't realize I was standing behind her. That was one of our big arguments, but there was nothing I could do about it. It was a trust issue with me. 
Alicia was the general's first daughter's name. He showed up at her christening and was crying as he held her. She was so beautiful in her little white dress. After the ceremony, we went out to lunch and the general paid the bill then quickly walked outside. I went out and saw him around the corner crying again. What's the matter, sir? Is there something I can do? We never intended for this to hurt you. I hope you know that. I told him. He was trying to wipe his eyes and stop the tears but they kept flowing. He shook his head and managed to say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be letting my feelings show. It's just that by now, Alicia and Sarah Marie, I'm sure have little ones of their own. I have grandchildren that I've never met and probably never will. It hurts. Blowing his nose on a tissue, he threw it into a trash container then turned and walked away before I could say anything. I had a thought and carefully picked up the tissue. I went inside the restaurant and asked if they had a baggie and the waitress said no, but she did produce some plastic wrap, so I bundled up the tissue which brought questions from the others. I didn't tell them anything. At home, I took the tissue and put two samples on Q-tips and sent them off to Ancestry.com on a hunch with my name and email as a contact. Imagine my surprise when two months later, I received an email from Emily Grayland and Jane Burke, sisters who had found out that they had DNA related to James. I asked their ages and about their background. They said grown up in Canada and were told that their records were lost. Their father was John Bronson and their mother was Carolyn. They also had a younger brother, Kenneth. Their family had moved to Alaska not too long after Kenny had been born because he needed medical attention that wasn't available in the logging town where they lived. It took John and their mother several years to get all their records straightened out, but eventually they had. They had eventually settled in southern Oregon near Roseburg, and the girls had married. John had died of cancer a few years back and their mother was in a nursing home in Roseburg and not doing very well. Emily had three daughters and Jane had three sons and a daughter. I emailed them for their phone numbers and said we needed to talk. They sent them to me and we got on a conference call. When I explained that their mother had been married to General Harold P. James and that their mother had run away with her lover when he had gotten her pregnant, taking the girls with them when she found out he had been injured and was coming home. The two lovers ran away and took them away with them. Both of the women said that they had memories of another father, but their mother had told them that they were wrong and to forget it. I asked who was older, and Emily said it was her, and I said, your name was Alicia. She gasps and said, that's my eldest daughter's name. Then I told Jane, your name was Sarah Marie. Do you recognize that? She started crying then told me it was her middle daughter's name and her oldest son was named James. Well, girls, it seems you have a decision to make. Do you want me to tell your real father that I have found you, or would you rather do it yourself? I'm married to his niece, and we have a son and daughter. My stupid mother doubted that I was his father and sent in to check his DNA against mine. Apparently, the girls were together as I could hear them whispering. Then they came back and asked, Do you know how we could get to meet him in person? I said, Ladies, I will see what I can do. Let me call you back once I have arranged things, okay? They both agreed though I could tell they were both crying. I called General James and said, General, I have a big favor to ask without you asking me too many questions. He asked me what I needed. I said, I need you to fly me to Roseburg, Oregon as soon as possible. No questions asked. Does this involve Kelly? He asked. Indirectly, I answered. It really affects you and your whole family, mine too. Harumph boy. Why are you being so secretive? He asked. You'll see, I said. He told me he couldn't make it until Saturday, and I said that would be fine. I called the ladies, and we made arrangements for them to be at the airport. I told them I would give them a time as soon as I knew what it would be. Saturday morning as we walked into the Roseburg airport, these two blonde lovelies ran up to the general and began kissing him from both sides. At first, he was trying to fend them off then turned to me and asked, Lieutenant Grant, What's the meaning of this? I smiled and said, Sir, don't you recognize Alicia and Sarah Marie? His eyes went wide and both of them said in unison, Daddy, we've missed you so much. Then began hugging and kissing him like crazy. For the third time, I watched as a steady stream of tears flowed down his cheeks. This time they were tears of joy. Then Alicia turned and waved as their husbands herded their kids out from the wings and introductions followed. I moved out of the way as the general needed to sit down to absorb all the attention he was getting. He had found his long-lost daughters and found that he had seven grandchildren he never knew about. 
I had to call Kelly and let her know we would be spending a few days there. We didn't leave until Wednesday afternoon and I thought the general's chest was going to explode. He was so proud. As we were about to leave, he said, Michael, I really owe you big time. You can't imagine how this feels to me. I will forever be indebted to you. Now let's get you back. My next duty station with Kelly and the kids was Hawaii. Man, what a place to be stationed. After I finished my tour, I went to work at a local firm designing power switching equipment and Kelly got a job with a good surgeon, Dr. Penrose, who specializes in orthopedic surgery. I really like him. He was in his late 40s and his wife was a real knockout. She was also his receptionist and kept pretty good tabs on him. Kelly worked for him for 15 years until he retired and sold his business to Dr. Shah. She is East Indian but very pleasant to be around and a first-class surgeon. She always wears puffy blouses and long skirts, hiding what I am sure is a very sexy body underneath. Always wanting to improve her surgical techniques, Dr. Shah went to a lot of training seminars and most often took Kelly with her. I was a good house husband and the kids were at the age where they were capable of taking care of themselves. They were teenagers after all. Soon, James was in college and Alicia was in high school and I had become the senior partner in the company and making a very nice income. Both of the kids had fairly nice cars and we had a lovely house with a pool and jacuzzi out back. Then Kelly went with Dr. Shah to Dallas for a two-week training on how to operate a robotic surgical device. She had been so excited about it because it was going to be the first one in our area and she kept telling me about how much better it was going to be for the patients and also for the doctors. It was a long two weeks without her. Plus Alicia was busy with school and her friends, so I was usually the only one home until Alicia got home and often she was staying with her girlfriends. After over 22 years together, Kelly was still as sexy as ever. She was definitely what I'd call a MILF and most of my friends had commented on how lucky I was. I had kept up a four-day-a-week regimen at the gym and could still wear the same size clothes as I had when I got out of the Air Force. I also ran to and from work, weather permitting. Even with all that work, our sex life had sure seemed to dwindle over the past few years. Not my desire, but Kelly's. It seemed she was either too tired, or busy or this hurt or something. She had asked me to please wait until she was in the mood because my constant asking was getting on her nerves, so I hadn't asked her in nearly two months, though she still hadn't initiated anything with me. It had been over six months since we had actually had sex. The afternoon I picked her up from the airport, Kelly was all over me on the ride home. She was stroking me outside my slacks, kissing my neck, rubbing my chest, and whispering what she was going to do to me once we got home. As soon as the garage door closed, she grabbed my hand and shoved it between her legs. Damn console. We had a smoldering kiss and she said, Quick, I need you to screw me now. She jumped out of the car as did I, only instead of heading inside. She pulled up her dress and laid down on the hood of the car, wiggling her finger at me. I was stone hard and more than ready. This was a Kelly I really didn't recognize. Kelly was coming yet again when the other garage door began to open and we jumped up and ran into the kitchen and upstairs to our bedroom, giggling like a couple of caught teenagers. A few minutes later Alicia came to our door and knocked, Mom, are you in there? Can I come in please? Kelly said, Honey, I need to clean up after my trip. I'll meet you in the kitchen. Pour me a big Sprite would you please? Sure mom, she said and we both giggled as she left. Kelly dropped her dress and she was naked underneath. I couldn't believe it and she pushed me back onto the bed, unzipped my pants, pulled them down and quickly mounted me. It only took a few minutes and she began to orgasm. She hopped off and said, Thanks hun, I really needed that. I sure hope there's more tonight. Got to see what Alicia wants. With that, she went into the bathroom then threw on some Daisy Dukes and a wife-beater t-shirt and headed downstairs to the kitchen. I got cleaned up and put on shorts and a t-shirt and headed downstairs. As I rounded the corner into the kitchen, Kelly saw me and shook her head no, letting me know this was a private conversation between the two of them, so I headed into my den and fired up my computer. First I went to our bank account and found there were a couple of charges in Dallas, one for a dress and one for a petty and bikini wax. Then I typed in Dallas Robotics Seminar and up popped their website of this year's event. The first several pictures were of the organizers, then the vendors and their wares, then the presenters and their bios, then a list of the attendees. Imagine my surprise to see my wife's picture. 
Kelly's picture showed her in a gorgeous little black dress, showing lots of cleavage with a pearl necklace and matching earrings that I had never seen before. She was wearing what appeared to be four or five inch CFM shiny red heels that matched her fingernails and lipstick. She was absolutely glowing. I printed out a picture of her and then laminated it and took it to our bedroom and hid it under my side of the mattress. My stomach was now churning. Was her horniness due to her trying to satisfy her guilt at having an affair at the seminar? How do I approach her with this? I called Kelly's favorite oriental place and ordered takeout to be delivered at 5.30. Alicia had a date and wasn't going to eat. That meant leftovers for her. Kelly was looking so sexy as she ate. She was eating so sexily I was having trouble reminding myself of her picture at the seminar until she got some sauce on her fingers from the sweet and sour shrimp and stuck them deep in her mouth and sucked them while slowly pulling them out with her tongue on the underside as she watched my face for my reaction. I picked her up and managed to carry her up the stairs to our bedroom, and I tossed her on the bed and quickly rid myself of my attire. Kelly had positioned herself on her hands and knees and said, Come on, big boy, show me how you can ride your witch, as she wiggled her bum in readiness. My wife never talked like this before going to this seminar. I did keep pounding away for her sake, and she was exploding like a broken slot machine. I think it was the anger that was making me do it. I don't know. Finally, Kelly said, Michael, please stop. I'm getting sore. So I pulled out and went into the bathroom to pee. I washed off then got into bed while Kelly used the restroom. She crawled under the covers and cuddled up tightly. We lay there in silence then I moved my arm. So it was under Kelly's head and she snuggled in tighter. I noticed a tear coming down her cheek and I asked, Care to tell me about it, sweetheart? Something happened at the seminar, didn't it? Kelly let out a big sigh, then turned onto her back, looking up at the ceiling and thought. Finally, she let out a big sigh and said, You know Michael, at the academy, you had all those gorgeous female cadets running around you could have had your pick of. Did you ever have sex with any of them, or think of having sex with any of them? Kelly, my love, the only woman that I wanted while I was there was you. Even when that nearly nude young cadet grabbed me and tried to pull me into that apartment, I knew I couldn't cheat on you. I knew if I did, I would lose you if it ever got back to you. She was quiet for a moment then said, What about the times you were on a mission and there were females along or females available for some easy sex? Did you ever think about playing with one of them? Now that one was harder as I had been sent as cover on a special ops mission down to South America and there were five female officers and me. Captain Tyler and I ended up in the same pup tent, and she slept in the nude and on top of her sleeping bag. I was trying to be a gentleman and kept turned away from her. In the middle of the night, she snuggled up tight to me and slid her hands under the sheet and into my boxers and began playing and teasing me. Captain Tyler could have easily been a playboy or hustler centerfold. It took everything I had to pull her hand out from under the sheet and calmly say to her, Captain, if I weren't married to the love of my life, I'd be screwing you until sunrise every night we were on this detail, probably longer. I love Kelly, and I will never do anything to risk our marriage. She is the love of my life, and our baby boy is a piece of heaven. Please understand. She moved somewhat on top of me and kissed me deeply and said, Hell, why are all the good ones like you already married? As she rolled over and pulled the sheet over herself. So I told Kelly the truth, almost, and said, Yes, dear. I had an officer come on to me once and made it very clear she wanted to have sex with me, but I told her that you were my life and that James was my piece of heaven and I would never risk losing you too. Kelly rolled her eyes at this then said, Okay then, what about all the times you had to take those road trips to check out equipment or do equipment installs? I mean you were sometimes gone for a week or two at a time. Didn't you get horny while you were gone? Were there women there that gave you relief? Or you wish they would have? Shaking my head I said, to be honest, no woman I met could hold a candle to my beautiful, sexy wife. If I needed relief, I would open my phone and look at those sexy pictures of you we took at that little B&B &B in the woods that spring. Remember that weekend? Then I'd use those pictures to please myself. I hope you don't get upset with me. I would stop at least a week before I came home so I wouldn't deprive you of any pleasure. What's up with all the questions? Are you going to tell me what happened at the seminar? Squeezing my hand, Kelly said, Promise not to get mad? I leaned up on my elbow and said, My dear, that all depends on what you have to tell me. 
Right now I'm on pins and needles and can't honestly say. Please tell me what's going on. She took a deep breath and said, Since you've never fantasized, this might be difficult for you. For the last couple of years, I have been having this fantasy of a lover taking me. Not away from you. Just for some fun. Some wild sex. Michael, I love you but we've gone stale and I'm desiring something else. My body is in turmoil and I find myself having fantasies about men I see. I mean in the grocery store, in the hospital, doctors, male nurses, that substitute mailman we had. I mean any good looking tall gentleman. I just don't want to hurt you. I told myself that it was just a fantasy and would try to be sexier for you but it never seemed to turn out right. Something always came up. The kids, you had to work late. I was called in for emergency surgery. It was always something. I wiped away a couple of tears on her cheeks. Honey, what would you say if I told you that I was feeling the same way? Only I wasn't fantasizing about anyone else. It was just reliving the wild times that you and I had and was wishing we could be doing that again. So what happened while you were in Dallas? I said. Sniffling, she said. I met someone. You what? I yelled as I sat up in bed. Kelly tried to calm me and said, No honey, it's not like that. Well, not completely. We didn't have sex. Not really. Let me tell you the whole story, but you need to calm down and be quiet. Can you do that? Kelly took a couple of deep breaths, then holding on tightly to my hand said, The first day or two, we were immersed in different seminars. Then the third day, one of the presenters, Dr. David Patterson, walked onto the platform and I felt my panties get wet. My palms became sweaty and I was having trouble listening to what he had to say. I was so enamored with this tall, handsome black doctor it wasn't funny. Don't say it. Yes, he is black but he is very much a gentleman and I think you will like him. Did she tell me that I will like him? She continued, That night we had a cocktail party and I got dressed up in a new red dress I had purchased. Yes, I bought it for him. It showed a lot of cleavage and was cut mid-thigh. It took me a while but I finally found David and seeing he was drinking wine. I grabbed two glasses from the steward and walked over to him, handing him one. He was surprised at my actions and told the others to excuse him and we began to talk. It was small talk and I found out that he was recently divorced. His wife had left him for another man. They hadn't had any children. Her idea? Not his. I talked about you and the kids and said that I worked at County General in LA with Dr. Shaw. He blinked and said, County General, really? I'm going to be starting there soon as the head of their new robotic team. I'm due to start there on the first of next month. We chatted until the cocktail party ended and David walked me to my room. He kissed me on the cheek and I returned one to him. Honey, I went in, stripped then pleased myself, thinking about him. I am sorry. The next night after our classes, they had a formal dinner and as I walked in with Dr. Shah, David was standing at the entrance and taking my arm asked, Would you mind if I joined you two beautiful ladies for dinner tonight? We walked over to the seating chart and somehow, his name had been inserted between Dr. Shah and me. Dinner was surprisingly good then they had the usual speeches and introductions. David was called up and introduced. He was one of the developers of this new operating robot. He returned and soon they were clearing off tables and making room as the band set up and the tables were moved to the edge of the room. David took my hand and said, This place is going to be too crowded. Follow me. He took me into the hotel's lounge where a three-piece combo was playing and we sat in a back booth. When the waitress came over and asked what I wanted to drink, David said, Two chocolate martinis, please. I smiled and said to him, How do you know I like chocolate martinis? He smiled and said, any woman so beautiful and sweet, must like chocolate martinis. Then he took my chin and pulled me into a soft kiss on the lips. It was so gentle and sent goosebumps all over. The waitress brought our drinks as the band began playing a slow song, and he pulled me up and we started to dance. I barely came up to his vest pocket. He's six feet seven inches, and you know I'm only five feet eight inches and with my two inch heels I was still short. David melted into me as we glided across the dance floor. We must have danced three or four dances before we went back to our booth and finished our drinks as two more quickly appeared. I looked at him and said, Are you trying to get me drunk so you can have your way with me? He smiled those perfect white teeth at me and said, Not really. When I make love to you, I want you to be fully aware and to be able to enjoy every second of it. As he kissed my hand then sucked my fingers. Felt sensation. 
We danced a couple of more times before I told him I needed to get some sleep. I had planned on calling you that night, but when I looked, it was already past one o'clock, so I figured you would be asleep. Again, David walked me to my room. Only this time when we kissed, it wasn't a kiss on the cheek, but our lips met firmly. Then our tongues began to dart together as he pulled me to him. God, Michael, part of me wanted him, so it wasn't funny, but he moved away and said, Good night, sweet Kelly. I'll see you tomorrow. He then turned and headed towards the elevator. I again pleased myself so hard and fast until I fell asleep that morning. Speaking of morning, I had overslept my first class when I heard someone knocking at my door. I was still naked as I had just thrown everything off when I came in so I could please myself. I grabbed my sweatshirt and threw it on, thinking it was Dr. Shaw. Imagine my surprise to see David pushing a cart filled with breakfast goodies. He was wearing a white t-shirt, shorts, and tennis shoes. My sweatshirt just barely covered my kitty, so I quickly moved back and sat on the edge of the bed, pulling the hem of the shirt down. Michael smiled and said, Phew, those are killer legs, Kelly. Then he pushed the cart over to me and piled food onto my plate. We were almost finished when I felt his socked foot rubbing up against my calf. At first, I thought I should move but I couldn't. His foot kept going higher and higher as he ate like nothing was happening. I was having trouble eating. He would rub one side of my thigh than the other side. I found myself spreading my thighs and moving my butt closer to the edge of the bed. Soon his long foot was lightly brushing my kitty, teasing me and I orgasmed. Honey, I damn near shoved that cart away and wanted to screw him on the floor right there. David removed his foot and slipped his shoes back on and stood up. His shorts were tinted with what was the largest tool I have ever seen. Well, the outline was. David started to move the cart towards the door and asked, Kelly, do you have a very nice dress to go to the goodbye ball tonight? I told him no as I really didn't know this was going to be a fancy affair. He smiled and said, Can you be ready in an hour? I'm taking you shopping. An hour later I was dressed and still tingling from his foot job. He was dressed very smartly in a sports coat, dockers, and penny loafers. I had on a cashmere button-up sweater, silk pedal pushers, and my two-inch heels. David walked me out to his big Mercedes, and we drove away. He took me to a lovely boutique where I tried on several dresses for him, but none met with his approval. Then we went to Dillard's where I tried on more dresses and shoes. David did like a pair of red patent leather 5-inch strappy heels and bought them for me. I told him I could buy my own, but he insisted. He still couldn't find a dress he liked. Then we went to Saks Fifth Avenue, and he had me try on several more dresses as he told the salesgirl, Sweetheart. I'm looking for a little black dress for my date that oozes sex. Do you have anything like that? She looked around and said, Sir, you should take her to Lucchese and tell them what you are looking for. I'm sure they have, or can make you up what you want. Please don't tell my manager I told you this as it could cost me my job. As soon as we walked into Lucchese, I knew this was the place. Their dresses were so very beautiful and this young man came up and asked, How can we help you today? Are you looking for a wedding dress? I laughed and David said, No, this is Kelly, my date, and I want her to be the sexiest lady at the ball. I want her to have a little black dress to end all LBDs. Do you have anything that can fit the bill? He looked at me and said, Honey, if we don't it, I'm sure we can throw something together for her post haste. David said, The dance is tonight. The salesman's eyes went wide and he said, Well, let's get this show on the road, shall we? He ushered us into a fitting room then brought us in a pitcher of wine and two glasses and after filling them left. About 15 minutes later, he returned with a young lady close on his heels. He had three dresses in his arms and she had two. They hung them up and he said, Darling, you can't try them on with clothes on. So I kicked off my shoes, pulled down my pants then unbuttoned and took off my sweater. The salesman tapped his foot and said, These dresses aren't made for bras either. He wanted me to remove my bra. David was eyeing me up and down, and I could see his manhood rising as he did. The salesman asked, Sweetie, do you want him to leave so you can try these on properly? I looked at David then calling upon all my courage I said, I don't think so. David is the one paying for my dress, and he's the one that has to approve of it. He stays. I thought the first three dresses looked fantastic, but David wanted to see them all. I damn near had to be poured into the fourth dress, but I'll have to admit, it was the sexiest one I had ever seen. David's eyes lit up and he said, We'll take it. 
The salesman asked, Sir, don't you want to know how much it is? David was almost drooling and said, Whatever it costs, it's worth it. The two of them left, and the young lady helped me out of it in dress. David pulled into the parking lot of a fancy jewelry shop and ushered me in. We walked over to the counter where the pearls were, and he began looking them over. This older gentleman came over and said, May I help you? David said, Yes, sir. I'm looking for a pearl necklace for my girl here and matching earrings. The old guy pulled out a couple of trays of necklaces and I started trying them on and David kept shaking his head no. Finally, in desperation, he reached over and unbuttoned my top three buttons and loosely held the longest strand saying, I want something that will show off these beauties. His mouth hung open for a moment then he got a big smile. He put back the trays and locked the cabinet and asked us to wait. He went into the back and came out with three black cases. These I keep in the safe he said, and as he opened them, there were these absolutely gorgeous long pearl necklaces. The cheapest one was $5,900. He picked it up and handed it to David. He placed it over my head, and it hung down over my breasts, just as David had wanted. David was nodding and said, let's see the others, as he took the first one off and laid it into its case. The second one had two strands and a set of earrings with four pearls each. David unclasped that one, and hooked it around my neck, then took the earrings and handed them to me. I removed the studs I had worn and put those pearl ones in, and went a look in the mirror. Wow was all I could think. I guess the smile on my face must have affected David because as soon as he saw it, he told the old guy, we'll take it, and handed him his credit card. I walked over to him and grabbing his arm and said, David, you can't keep spending money on me like this. It isn't right. I feel like you're trying to buy me. I'm not a hooker. Please tell the gentleman you have changed your mind. Just then the old guy walked over with David's receipt and his card. David signed it and said, Sorry, too late. It's yours now. He took me back to the hotel, and I went to my room and cried. Then I remembered that I hadn't called you so I did, and you were so happy to hear me. I really felt guilty then, looking at the new dress and the case with the pearls. As you were finishing up, you said, Honey, I'm glad you're having fun. Relax and enjoy yourself. Remember you only live once. God Michael. It was like you were telling me to go ahead and screw David. I showered then headed down to the hotel's beauty salon and had them do my hair, give me a manicure and add some long red nails, do a pedicure with matching red polish, and told them to give me a Brazilian wax job. I wanted David to have something special to remember me by. I was pleased with my look and tipped them all nicely. I went to my room and stripped and put on the dress. I slipped on those tall red heels and found that they were a lot harder to walk in than I had thought. Luckily, I had two hours before David was supposed to be here, so I took my room key and cell phone and headed out the door. I walked up and down the corridor for a while, then hit the elevator and walked around the lobby. Damn, I was hit on by at least a dozen men or more. Three times security asked me for my room card. Finally, I asked the older one why I was being challenged for my room key and he said, To be honest, miss, when a girl dressed as sexy as you are, she's usually a hooker and we have to chase them out. I'm not calling you a hooker. I'm just saying that you are very hot looking and I hope your husband will be down soon to fend off all the wolves that want to drag you up to their rooms. Just being curious, I sauntered into the lounge, shaking my bum a little more than I normally do, and almost every man in there took notice of me as I walked up to the bar and asked for a chocolate martini. Three men surrounded me saying, I'll pay for that add it to my tab. Introductions were made, and they wanted to know what I was doing in there. I said that I was thirsty and just came down for a quick drink. Soon there were four or five chocolate martinis in front of me, so we kept talking and I kept drinking. I'm not sure how many I had put down when my cell phone started buzzing, and it was David. He was up at my room and was looking for me. I told him I was in the bar and giggled and told him my new friends were buying me chocolate martinis. He was down there in a flash. He looked at the guys and told them something, I'm not sure what, as I was having trouble navigating or hearing and the three of them took off in a flash. He looked at me and asked, what the hell do you think you were doing? I said, sweetheart, I was trying to be able to walk better in these heels and the security guard told me that I was turning on every guy in the hotel and being curious, I came in here. I was only going to have one drink then go back to my room to wait for you. Then these three guys came over and kept buying me drinks. We were talking and I'm not sure how many I drank. How do I look? David shook his head then said, 
I think the security guard was right, but we really need to get some food in you right now. Did you have any lunch? I shook my head no, and he took me to a booth and told the waitress to bring us two cheeseburgers with fries and chocolate shakes. I didn't think I was hungry, but I did manage to eat half of the lunch, and the chocolate shake really hit the spot. By the time we had finished, I had pretty much sobered up and I apologized to David. We went to the goodbye festivities and had missed the dinner, which I heard was terrible anyway. Overdone chicken you know. The dancing had just begun. My new shoes brought me up closer to David's face, and kissing him was a lot easier. I was rubbing myself hard on his steel-like shaft. Hard enough that I had several very nice orgasms as we French kissed. The band said they were done for the night, and David took my hand grabbed my room key and cell phone. We were making out in the elevator. We got into my room, and I yanked my dress off and stood there, and almost tore off his clothes until he was just in his boxers. He held me and we kissed again. He said, Kelly, are you really ready to cheat on Michael? Forsaking your wedding vows. I'm falling in love with you, and I'm worried that you may be falling for me. If I make love to you, I will do my best to break up your marriage. Is that what you want? It was like someone had hit me up the side of my head with a brick. I turned on my side and began crying. David pulled the covers over me, then laid down next to me and comforted me. Kelly, that was the single most difficult thing I have ever done. I want you to think it over and be sure. If you want out of your marriage with Michael, I'm here for you. I don't think he would put up with sharing you, would he? I shook my head. Oh God, what had I done? I thought. I turned to him and gave him a quick kiss on the lips and told him, David, please go before I really do something stupid. Michael, do you hate me? She asked. Trying to keep from yelling, I said, Kelly, you said that you didn't cheat or have sex, yet you stood naked in front of him and played with his huge tool, said you gave him B-job, then let him eat you to several orgasms. That's oral sex. It's sex. God damn it. You didn't stop him. He stopped you. Now you tell me that he's moving to our town and going to be working with you? Are you going to be screwing him on the side, or should we just get divorced? She was crying now and said, Michael, I don't think it was cheating. I have these urges that I can't explain. Do you think you could allow me to see him once in a while to get this out of my system? I was incensed and though not yelling, I was rather loud and said, So you want my permission to go screw this hung black doctor while I sit at home twiddling my thumbs? Is that it? How would you feel if I had asked you if I could screw some young chick while you sat at home or were at work? Would you give me permission? Kelly looked at me then said, it depends on if you gave me permission to. Screw you, Kelly. I yelled, that's not the point. I mean before this. You already told me that he wants a permanent relationship with you. He wants to break up our marriage so he can have you for himself. Kelly looked at me and said, that's never going to happen, Michael. Shaking my head, I said, oh, it will if I find out you have screwed him. It's about to happen with what you already did with him. I have never cheated or even wanted to cheat on you. And now I find out you have done this with this David fellow. What did you expect to happen when you told me? That I'd tell you to bring him home, so I could watch him screw you in our bed? Kelly said, well, I had hoped you might like that. I know you like interracial porn. This would be your own personal version with upfront seating. I looked at her and said, Kelly James Grant, are you out of your mind? She began crying and left the bedroom, grabbing her nightgown on the way out. My wife of 22 years had just told me after returning from a two-week training seminar in Dallas that she wanted to have an affair with a black doctor and had invited him to her room, gotten naked in front of him, played with his tool, and begged him to screw her but he had questioned her true intentions and she reluctantly backed out. I was in turmoil and sick to my stomach. After she left, there was a knock at my door and I said, Come in, and in walked Alicia, our daughter. She asked, Daddy. Is it true that mom wants you to allow her to have sex with a black man and that she already let him go down on her? She rushed to me and threw her arms around me. I'm sorry. I heard you two talking and I was listening at the door. Are you going to divorce her? Do you think marriage counseling might help? I know my English teacher caught his wife in bed with their black neighbor and he divorced her. Only she move in with him as soon as he filed for divorce. What is it with white women and black men? I hugged her and said, Honey. A lot of black men have very big and long tools, and some women like them better than guys that are built normally. Alicia surprised me when she said, Oh daddy, 
I know several white guys with tools, just as big as black dudes have. Then she realized what she s one aid and shut up. I asked, from personal experience? She looked down then shook her head no then said, from some of my girlfriends, and they have shown me pictures from their phones. I don't feel right discussing my sex life with my father. I smiled and said, honey, I will never judge you or go beat up your boyfriend. That is unless he mistreats my angel. You can feel free to discuss anything with me that you have with your mother. Please don't think you have to keep secrets from me. Then I gave her a big hug. Then she left, and I tried to get some sleep, but I did have trouble. When I woke late that morning, Kelly was already gone and her note said she had gone to work, which was weird because she wasn't due to work today. I called her office and they told me that today was her day off. My heart sank. Now she was lying to me. I drove over to County General and circled it several times but didn't see her car. I pulled out, but instead of heading left towards home, I went right. As I went down the boulevard I passed this restaurant that Kelly and I liked, and there was her explorer next to a black Mercedes. I almost flattened two of his tires and disabled her engine but instead walked in and saw them in a back booth, holding hands across the table. I asked the waitress if the bar was open, and she said yes. I handed her a $10 bill, and asked her to bring me a double bourbon and coke, tall. I pointed to where I'd be sitting. Then I marched over to Kelly and plunked my bum down next to her, which surprised the shit out of her. She was at a loss for words as I extended my hand and said, David, I presume. I'm Michael, Kelly's husband, at least for the time being. Probably not much longer. The waitress brought my drink and my first taste halfway emptied the glass. So far neither of them had said a word. Then Kelly asked, Michael, how did you find us? I smiled and said, I have my spies, not wanting her to know actually how I found them. David finally spoke and said, It's nice to meet you, Michael. Kelly has nothing but nice things to say about you. I turned to face Kelly and said, Yeah, but it's too bad. I'm not tall, dark, handsome, and hung like she's looking for. Kelly gasped and began crying. David stood and said he needed to get going. I asked him to stay so we could talk but he put a $20 bill on the table and walked out. Kelly was huddled in the corner of the booth and I asked her, Why did you lie to me? I didn't lie, she said. That's funny because your note said you were going into work today, but when I called, they told me it was your day off and they hadn't seen you, I said. Her lip quivered and she began crying. Kelly said through her sniffles, David texted me asking to meet to talk and I knew you wouldn't believe me so I left that note. I knew you were mad at me already and I didn't want to add fuel to the fire. I downed the second half of my drink then said, Kelly, we need to talk at home. I'm going to follow you there. Let's get out of here. We headed out with me on her tail. Three times Kelly went through a yellow light late but I stayed with her, catching the red twice. I wasn't letting her get away. Each time I could see her craning her neck to see if I was still behind her. We got home and we sat down at the kitchen table and I got us both bottles of water. Kelly was as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. I smiled and said, So I take it you still want him. I guess that means I'm going to have to file for divorce, doesn't it? Kelly, I can't take your lying to me. She started to howl and said, No, Michael, I don't want a divorce. I love you. Can't you understand that I need to find out what's driving this itch inside of me? Don't you care about my feelings? Don't you love me anymore? Shaking my head, I said, my sweet darling, I have loved you ever since I first saw you that first day in high school. When we got married, we made a vow to be faithful to each other until death do us part, remember? Well, dear, I'm not dead and don't plan on it for quite some time. It seems that you can't say the same. You say you love me, but if you did, you wouldn't want to go have sex with David. You never would have allowed him to see you naked or have oral sex with you. I thought maybe I could forgive you that and then today. I find you lying to me and find you with him, probably plotting to meet up with him for sex, if I'm not mistaken. Kelly was wringing her hands and looking at the table for several minutes, then finally looked up at me, saying, Michael, it was nothing like that. We were just talking. David wanted to know how I was doing, and if I had told you what we had done. When I told him that I had, he wanted to know your reaction, and I had told him that you threatened to divorce me if we had sex. He smiled and said to me, Well, then that would make it that much easier for you to become my wife. That's about the time you sat down next to me. Kelly said trying to not look at me. I looked straight into her eyes and said, Kelly, 
I honestly don't believe you. I feel that you are going to go ahead and have sex with him no matter what I say, aren't you? Then I added. Or have you already? She didn't answer me. She just hung her head, looking at her hands. Fine. I guess that's my answer, isn't it? I said as I got up. Just then Alicia stepped into the kitchen and said, Dad, I don't think Kelly wants to be a part of our family anymore. It seems all she wants is her black lover instead of her family. Dad, just let her go. We can get along fine without the witch. Kelly jumped up and was going to hit Alicia and I grabbed her arm before she could. Then she yelled at her saying, How dare you call me Kelly instead of mom? I'm your mother and don't you forget it, young lady. It was everything I could do to hold her back from Alicia as I had both wrists held tightly. Alicia said, Since you think you can go screw some hung black man and have my father willingly take you back, you must be brain dead. In fact, to me you are dead. You are no longer my mother. To me you're a 304 so I'll call you Kelly instead of 304 or should I just use the terms? Now Kelly was really pulling trying to get at Alicia but I held her wrists firmly. Alicia looked at me and said, let her loose dad. I can take care of her. Remember I have four years of judo and karate under my belt. Let's see if she can take me. That seemed to take the fight out of Kelly and she relaxed and began to sob uncontrollably. Alicia turned and walked out and I followed. I had to go to work. As soon as I got in, I was summoned to the conference room where the board of directors was meeting. It seems my two junior partners had convinced the board that we should purchase Evergreen Industries. The owner was wanting to retire. He was the sole owner and was willing to take cash down to pay off the 50 acres he was buying in Montana and a new 4x4 truck, plus stocks in our company. He owned four plants in the greater Seattle area and the board wanted me to go with the two junior partners to visit all four plants and make decisions as to what we were going to do with those plants, upgrade, downsize, or sell. I really didn't want to leave right now, especially with Kelly's infatuation with David, and tried to beg off, but they insisted. I tried to call Kelly, but her cell phone went immediately to voicemail. Then I called Alicia and gave her the news. She said, No, Daddy. That will give her just the opportunity she wants. As soon as you leave, you know she's going to jump into bed with him, don't you? There's not much I can do about that, honey, I said. I feel your mother has already made up her mind. She thinks that it's not really cheating that it's just an itch she needs to scratch. Only that itch has torn our marriage to pieces and I don't think it can ever be put back together. What do you think? I could hear my daughter sniffling as she said, Daddy, couldn't you have her committed or something? Maybe get her doctor to force her into counseling? She has to be crazy to throw your marriage out the window after all these years together. There was a long pause then she asked, Daddy, you've never cheated on her, have you? I answered, No honey, the few times I was tempted, but I always thought of my beautiful wife and never strayed. And the longer we were married, the easier it was to say no to temptation. I really had planned on growing old with your mother. How long are you going to be gone? She asked. Most of next week, unfortunately. We leave Sunday afternoon and don't return until Saturday mid-morning. I told my daughter. Daddy no, you know she's going to use that opportunity to screw him, don't you? She cried. I said, probably. I won't know unless I hire a private investigator or something. Alicia said, don't worry daddy. I'll be watching her every chance I get. It was Thursday and I really wasn't into working so I told my secretary that I was leaving for the day. As I was about to pull out of our parking lot, I remembered that Alicia loved the root beer float ice cream from the little specialty ice cream shop about two blocks away, so I made a left instead of my usual right. I was about to pull in when I saw a store just before the ice cream shop that caught my eye. I'd seen it before but hadn't really paid it much attention before. It was called I Spy, Toys That Tell It All. I pulled into their parking lot, and stepped inside. The place was full of all sorts of exotic cameras and things to spy on people. The salesman, a guy about my age, came up and said, Hi, I'm Tony. Let me guess, you think your wife is cheating on you and you want to find out for sure? Right. I looked at him and said, Are you a mind reader too? He laughed and said, Nope, I've just seen the look on too many men like you before. It's terrible that in this day and age, it's the wives that have taken to cheating on their husbands a lot more than the other way around. On the plus side, it sure keeps my bank account happy. He smiled as he patted his cash register. 
He showed me a lot of things, but what I settled on was four motion-activated micro-cameras that sent their signal to a receiver that would tie it to my computer, and also to the cloud, so I could access them at any time. I also bought a GPS tracker for Kelly's car and a program that I could install on Kelly's phone if she hadn't changed her password so that I would get copies of all her incoming and outgoing texts and phone calls saved to the cloud also. He also recommended a battery backup with a couple of solar panels in case of power loss. I figured what the hell as he gave me a discount for the entire package. As I was paying for them, the salesman looked at my debit card and asked, Mr. Grant, do you have a beautiful blonde daughter named Alicia? I was taken aback but nodded yes. Do you know that she was in here when I opened this morning and bought several cameras herself? She said something about catching her skank mother. She didn't seem very happy about what was going on. Let me get you the frequency her cameras are on so that you can add them to your iCloud account. I stood there while he wrote the information down on my instruction booklet. I said goodbye and headed home. Alicia was there and I walked up and gave her a big hug then asked her, Honey, just so we don't duplicate ourselves, tell me where you hid your cameras? Her face had a shocked look for a second, then she broke into laughter and pulled me around and showed me where she had placed them. I added mine to a few other places and then my daughter said, You know dad, I'd bet we could make a couple of pretty good private investigators. Don't you? As she bumped me with her hip, that night Kelly got home late again, showered, and went straight to bed, saying she had a very rough day with three surgeries back to back. She crawled into our bed, so I went into the guest bedroom, at least for the first hour. I then got up and retrieved her phone from her purse from the kitchen counter where she normally throws it. She had changed her password, damn her. So I tried her birthday, no luck, our anniversary, then James's birthday, then Alicia's. Then I remembered her parents' anniversary and bingo, it opened. I plugged her phone into my computer and uploaded the program into her phone. It took me almost 45 minutes for me to do all the updates and configure it so I could get it sent to my phone, my computer, and the cloud. Then I shut her phone off, wiped it down, put it back in her purse, then took the GPS out to her car and placed it in her trunk, behind her spare tire. I then went back to the guest bedroom and tried to get some sleep. Kelly was gone when I got up so I called her and got her voicemail. I asked her to call me when she got a chance. I went to work but my head wasn't really into it. At lunchtime, I told my secretary that I needed to go home and pack for the trip. That was just an excuse because all my mind was seeing was images of Kelly and David in her hotel room with her naked and asking him to screw her. God, what happened to the woman I had loved for half my life? I got into my car then headed to my bank and after pulling half out, I took my name off our joint account. I left Kelly's debit card activated but canceled her credit card. I then pulled 80% of the money out of our savings account and had them issue me a cashier's check. I was the only one putting money into it since we opened it. I took it to another bank and opened a new account. I called my old friend and former lawyer, Ben Foster, and went over to his house. I explained my situation and he kept shaking his head and couldn't believe Kelly could do something like this. I signed a quick claim deed and sold him 99% of my shares in the company for $1 with a side stipulation that once this was over, I could buy it back for no more than twice that amount and that he or his heirs couldn't sell it to anyone else without first offering it to me at that price. He also wasn't allowed to disclose the price he paid for it. He called his former secretary and she came over and notarized the documents. We shook hands then I left. I was partway home when everything hit me like a ton of bricks and I began crying. I was crying so hard I had to pull over. I couldn't see the road. I didn't realize that this was a loading zone until this female officer tapped on my window, asking me for my driver's license and registration. She could see that the front of my shirt was wet from my tears. When she asked why I had stopped and what was wrong, I blurted out the whole story. My tears kept flowing and she asked me to step to the sidewalk. She asked if I had been drinking and I smiled and said, I wish, but no, beautiful, I haven't had any, unless you would care to go have one with me. I chuckled a bit which seemed to stop the tears. Officer Foster, well that's what her name tag read, said, I don't think you really need anything to drink right now, though you could probably use some company. Besides, I don't think my husband would like it if I went with you. He's a detective on the force and kickboxes for fun. I could see myself getting trounced by a jealous husband and stepped back against my car. She smiled and said, I do however have a younger sister that you might enjoy taking out for a few drinks tonight. 
She kicked out her cheating husband two years ago, and I've been after her to get out of the house and have some fun. Let me give her a call. I started to tell her not to make that call, but before I could say anything, she was talking to her sister, Cassie, telling her that she had met a nice gentleman that could use some cheering up and that I wanted to take her out for a nice dinner, dancing, and drinks. She looked at me and nodded as if to ask me if that was all right, and I shrugged my shoulders and nodded yes. I heard her say, yes, you will go. So get fancied up, and I'm going to have him pick you up at 6.30. His name is Michael Grant, and his wife is cheating on him, and he's going to divorce her. He's not expecting anything from you other than some good company and talk. Got it, sis? I didn't know what to say. I had just been set up by this cute officer, and didn't know whether I should be happy about it or not. She gave me Cassie's address and cell phone number and said, Michael, treat her right. Remember, I have all your information here on my pad. I think the two of you need each other right now. So go have a little fun. Sure. I drove home in a fog. I still hadn't heard from Kelly, but Alicia was there. She could see the tear stains on my shirt and gave me a long hug and said, Daddy, it's going to be all right. We will be fine without her, I promise. I looked at my beautiful daughter and said, what would you say if I told you that I was stopped by a female officer today because I had pulled over due to me crying so hard that I couldn't see where I was going? I broke down and told her the whole story then she pulled me out of the car and we talked on the curb. She wanted to know if I had been drinking and I jokingly asked her if she would like to have a drink with me. She informed me that her husband was also on the force and was also a kickboxer. Then she proceeded to call her younger sister and set me up with a date with her for tonight. Honey. I haven't been on a date with another woman, ever. Am I being a cad? Alicia smiled and gave me another big hug and said, Daddy, you'd better go get cleaned up and I want you to look your best. I'm not saying I want you to jump her bones. I just want you to go have some fun. Relax and talk with this. What's her name? I said Cassie. Okay, Cassie then. You take her out and enjoy yourself. Kelly has torn your heart out. Our hearts really. Don't dwell on her screwing you over. Only think of your date. Promise me that, please. I looked at my daughter and said, Alicia, my sweetness, when did you grow up and become so wise beyond your years? Without you, I think I might have crawled into a hole and died. Thank you. Alicia asked, Have you told James yet? I shook my head no. Well, tonight I'm giving him a call and he's going to get an ear full. I'm not going to pull any punches. Now get upstairs, get cleaned up and ready for your date. I went up to my bedroom and showered, shaved, and put on a nice pair of slacks, a dress shirt, some matching penny loafers, and a sports coat to go with everything then headed downstairs to have myself a glass of wine. I still hadn't heard from Kelly though my phone showed she had texted David and it said, Barney's 7 o'clock. He had texted back, MP first. I just shook my head and shortly afterward my wife walked in and tried to give me a kiss on the cheek, but I pulled away. It didn't phase her as she headed up to our bedroom showered, and got herself ready to go out. She came out looking so damn good. I really wanted to pull her back to the bedroom and rip her clothes off of her and screw her silly, but I knew she wasn't dressed that way for me. She had on a sheer white peasant blouse, tight black yoga pants, and black pumps. I looked at her and asked, Honey, why are you dressed like that? Are you going to meet David? She smiled and said, Michael, I would never do that. I told you he was just a fantasy. I'm meeting a few of the other nurses for a ladies' night out to get rid of some stress. We'll probably be out late, so don't wait up, Kay. Darling? She wanted to give me a kiss on the cheek, but it was an air kiss. She hadn't even noticed that I was dressed up. Oh well, the lying witch. I checked the GPS movement on her car, and it showed it going to the ritzy part of the city where the new townhouses were. I guess that was where David lived. My app showed his address and I put a pin on it and closed the app. Looking at my watch, I figured I had better get going to meet Cassie. My wife, well soon to be ex-wife, had left the house supposedly to meet with her girlfriends, but I already knew she was meeting up with her boyfriend. What she didn't realize was that a kind-hearted officer had stopped to see why I was parked in a loading zone crying and after hearing my story, set me up with her divorced sister. I really hadn't dated anybody other than Kelly, nearly 30 years ago. Anxious to see what was going to happen, I got in my car and headed out. I stopped and picked up a lovely bouquet of flowers then headed to her house. Apparently, she had done well for herself because it was in a very nice home in an upscale neighborhood. 
I rang the bell and damn near swallowed my tongue. Standing there in front of me was the living version of Jessica Rabbit. I mean flaming red hair, huge jugs, slinky waist though she didn't have a big bum, and her legs, OMG. She was wearing a tight black silk top her black and white pleated skirt, was about mid-thigh in length, and she was wearing 4-inch CFM black patent leather heels with nylons. Cassie looked me up and down then smiled and said, Nice to meet you, Michael. I see Laura didn't exaggerate when she told me about you. Would you care for a drink before we leave? I really should put those lovely flowers in a vase with some water. Come in, as she took them from my hand. As I walked into her home, I could see it was very well appointed and I told her so. She thanked me, and we walked into the kitchen, and she poured each of us a glass of wine. She already had the wine open and two glasses out. Hmm. I leaned against her counter watching her as she bent over looking under the sink for a vase. The one she wanted was way in the back, giving me a lovely view of her stocking tops. My head and tried to get those thoughts out of my mind. Remembering Officer Foster's words. Cassie put the flowers into the vase with water and we chatted a bit while we finished the first glass of wine then the second before I said we needed to get going. I took her to Delaney's Steakhouse. They have the very best aged steaks on the West Coast as far as I'm concerned. Cassie seemed concerned about the prices and I assured her not to worry. I could afford it. I said, I think you deserve something special. Would you like to try the beef wellington or the bacon-wrapped filet mignon? She smiled like a kid locked in a candy store and asked, Are you sure it's okay? I told her to pick one and she said, I've never had a beef wellington. I really would like to try it if that's okay with you. I motioned to the waitress and we placed our orders. Dinner and conversation were delightful. Then we moved to the bar with its dance floor and dancing with her was like moving a cloud. Plus she smelled so good. I could have devoured her for dessert. She pressed me and I told her the story of Kelly and David. Cassie shook her head and hugged me. I found myself forgetting about Kelly until I got a message on my phone from her phone that was from one of her friends, asking her where she was at. They were at the playpen and had expected her to be there. Her reply was, I got tied up with something more important. See you at work. Kisses. I looked at my lovely date and asked, how would you like to have a little fun? She asked what was on my mind. I said, well, my wife and her lover are over at Barney's tonight. How about you and I go over there for a few drinks and dances and see if she notices? Her girlfriends just texted her wanting to know why she hadn't met them at the playpen for drinks like she said she would. Cassie said, Cool. I like your style. Let's go rub it in her face. I can be just as nasty as you'd like if that's what you want. I smiled and nodded at her. I paid the tab and we headed to my car. We were about halfway to Barney's when she asked, Michael, how are you getting your wife's texts? I smiled and said, somehow, now they show up on my phone. It must be magic. Or a very sneaky spy program I installed on her phone after she told me about her plans to have sex with David. Cassie shook her head and squeezed my hand. She leaned over and kissed my cheek saying, remind me never to get on your bad side, okay? We got to Barney's and it was packed as usual on a Friday night. I had my arm around Cassie's waist when she said, is that them? As she pointed to the far corner. I swallowed hard as I saw my soon-to-be ex-wife in the dress that she had described, the one that David had bought for her in Dallas. I will have to admit, she did look damn hot in the little black dress with her tall red CFM heels on and the pearls and earrings accentuating her jugs. David had his hand inside of her dress, fondling her bum then Cassie said, Did you let her leave home dressed like that? I shook my head and said, No, she was wearing a white peasant blouse black yoga pants, and pumps when she left. I've never seen her in that dress before. She told me he bought it for her when they were in Dallas. The pearls and earrings too. I did track her car to where I believe David lives though tonight. Cassie shook her head and said in my ear, I'd bet she screwed him there too. I cringed but figured she was right. We waited as they danced another dance before sitting down at a booth in the back. We stood at the bar enjoying a drink and talking about our lives for a bit until a booth not too far from them opened up and Cassie pulled me over to it. Kelly and David didn't notice. They were too involved with each other. As a good old rock and roll song started, Cassie said, Can you swing dance? I smiled and stood up, pulling her up out of the booth and we hit the dance floor like I did when I was in high school. Damn, it felt good dancing with her. Kelly never cared for doing the swing. 
Cassie was an excellent dancer, and we were getting pretty wild. I was spinning her around and sliding her through my legs and across my back. Pretty soon the crowd had separated giving us room to really show off. Just as the song ended, I pulled her down under my legs then yanked her hard and flung her into the air where she flew up, twirled, then spread her arms and came down with her legs around my waist and her jugs in my face, sliding slowly down my body, very seductively and ended it with a smoldering kiss. The crowd went wild with yells, screams, and applause. We turned to go back to our table when I heard Kelly yell, Michael Grant, what the hell do you think you're doing? I turned and she was storming towards us, with David on her heels. Cassie and I moved to our table and sat down then Kelly continued. What's the big idea, Michael? You're my husband and who the hell is this? What makes you think you can flaunt her out like this in front of me and all these people? I thought you loved me? Before I could say anything, Cassie stood up and got her face. Listen, Missy, you think it's okay if you screw David here, but you go ballistic if your sweet husband goes on a date with another woman. Isn't that being hypocritical, you witch? Kelly stammered a bit then said, but he's my husband and I love him. Cassie laughed and said, yeah, right? You love him so much you're screwing David here. Tell me, how do you think that's love, honey? Please, explain it to me. Kelly said, it's just something I need to do and get out of my system. Then I'm coming back to Michael to still be his loving wife. What can't you understand? Cassie shook her head and got closer to Kelly's face and said, You're a crazy witch. If you think that you can go screw David then go back to Michael, you're off your rocker. 99% of men, Michael included, won't put up with a wife screwing around, and especially when she throws it in his face as you have. If I were in his place, I'd have already kicked your cheating bum out the door. I hope you realize you have thrown away the best thing you ever had. Kelly screamed at her, No, I'm coming back to him, honest. I looked at her and said, Kelly, I'm not putting up with your crazy ideas. I'm already talking to a lawyer. You're allowing him into your room, getting naked in front of him, playing with his tool, allowing him to give you B-job then begging him to screw you is more than I can handle. You don't seem to want to be my wife, so I'm going to give you your freedom. You can go screw whomever you wish. By the way, I have to leave on Sunday to go to Seattle for a week on business. If you persist with having an affair with David, we're through. Got it. Kelly was crying and said, Honest, Michael, we haven't had sex. Then she turned to David and said, Have we, dear? David didn't answer. He just looked at the floor. I said, Well, Kelly, I guess I have my answer. She grabbed David's lapels and shook him and said over and over, Tell him. Tell Michael we haven't had sex yet. I stood in as Cassie was about to leave. I said, Kelly, I pray I don't find positive proof that you two have been intimate or divorce proceedings will begin. Do I make myself perfectly clear? It's your call, David or me. Cassie pulled me towards the exit though I had to stop and settle our tap. Once in the car, I started it and Cassie reached out and took my hand in hers. She leaned over and kissed my cheek then we drove in silence to her place. I got out, opened her door then walked her to her front door. Cassie turned and thanked me for a wonderful evening and I said, even having to put up with all the drama? She unlocked her door then said, Michael, I've never done this before, but would you like to come in and spend the night with me? I moaned then kissed her deeply and said, more than you will ever know my sweet lady, more than you will ever know, but I'm still married. Even though she isn't sticking to our wedding vows, I feel obligated to abide by them until a judge voids them. I hope you can understand. Cassie was looking so deeply into my eyes. I felt like she was looking into my soul. She smiled and said, You are a good man, Michael Grant. Please don't forget me and keep me in your thoughts if you ever change your mind. She gave me a deep kiss, our tongues darting together as her hand cupped my manhood and she moaned, Nice. I left and went home to wait to see if Kelly would return. About three o'clock in the morning, I got a call from her friend Phyllis saying that Kelly was there and told her she couldn't go home and wanted me to know she was okay. I figured she had gone ahead and screwed David and didn't want to confront me. My trip to Seattle was hectic. Evergreen Industries wasn't quite the good by it was portrayed to be, at least at the Tacoma plant wasn't. We were going over their records, and the timesheets showed a very poor attendance record. I met with HR and told them that when we took over, we were going to institute mandatory drug and alcohol testing before allowing an employee back without a doctor's note if they missed a day from work. 
She smiled and said, That's about time someone grew a set of balls around here, sir. Most of our absentees are either Thursday, the day after payday, or Monday after a weekend of partying. If they're sick or their kids are, they better go to the doctors and get checked out. Our insurance covers that. I got her name. I already liked her. Just before noon, I got a call from my daughter. She said, Dad, I was with my friend and she was taking me home to get a change of clothes because I spilled ice cream all over my dress and Kelly was standing in the driveway talking on a new cell phone. I think she may be on to us. David must have gotten her a burner phone. I hunkered down so she didn't see me and as soon as she left, I went back to the house and changed clothes then called the school and told them I had gotten sick. The GPS shows her car is parked at the Sheraton downtown. When I was changing clothes, there was a notepad in the kitchen and I could make out some scribbles where she had written on the previous page. I rubbed a pencil across it but couldn't tell if it was room 1117 or 1119, so I'm going to grab my little recorder and your Nikon and head up there. Wish me luck. Alicia, wait. I said but it was too late. She had hung up. This next part is what Alicia told me. Alicia's side of story. I got to the Sheraton and walked in like I owned the place so no one questioned me. They had almost an hour's head start on me so I figured they'd be busy little beavers and took the elevator to the 11th floor. 11.17 and 11.19 were at the end of the corridor and listening to the door, it was easy to hear Kelly orgasming in the last one. 11.19. I turned on the recorder and slid it under the door as far as it would go hooked to my selfie stick. I had plugged in an earpiece and was listening to her tell him how good he was and how much she loved getting a bigger one than my father. This was going on for almost half an hour when I felt a tap on my shoulder and behind me stood the manager and he asked, What are? I put my fingers to my lips to get him to be quiet and moved us away from the door. I whispered into his ear and said, My mother and her lover are in there and she is cheating on my father. I'm trying to get evidence so that he can divorce her. Please don't give me away, sir. I love my father so much and she is so screwed up in the head. She told him she wants to have this affair, and when it's over, she wants to come back to him. Only it has crushed him. Heck, it has crushed me too. Please don't kick me out. He looked at me then said, Miss, I hate cheaters. My ex cheated on me for years before I found out. Does your camera video record? I nodded. He smiled and asked, Get it ready? I got the camera set to record and moved the voice recorder out of the way, putting it in my purse. He got his master key ready and quickly stuck it into the lock. He gave me the thumbs up and I returned one to him. We stepped in and my former mother was on her hands and knees, howling like an animal and David was behind her taking long strokes into her kitty. They didn't even notice us as we slowly walked up to them. She was telling him to screw her harder, deeper. He said you got it babe, and here it comes now as he exploded into my former mother. That's when David turned and saw us standing there, me recording everything with my father's camera. I heard him yell, Oh, Kelly, it's Alicia and she's recording us. Kelly turned her head in sort of a dreamy state, then was snapped back to reality when she saw me and the manager standing there. He said, Dr. Patterson and Mrs. Grant, please get dressed and remove yourselves from my establishment. I do not condone cheaters here, and if you stay more than 10 minutes, I will be calling the police and charging you with trespassing. Do I make myself perfectly clear? David was frantically trying to find his clothing as Kelly pulled the sheet around her and called for me to come to her. I said, Sorry, you 304 and my former mother. You have really gone and screwed your life away this time. A copy of this is already being sent to the cloud, Daddy and his parents, James, Grandma Thompson, your sister, your employers, everyone on your computer's contact list, and Daddy's lawyer. Also, don't bother coming home as you no longer live there. By the time you get there, all the locks will be changed, as will be the security code on the alarm and the garage door openers. You might as well move in with your lover. You can enjoy him anytime you wish from now on. I will put all your things in garbage bags and they will be on the curb by tonight, though I think I may burn the wedding dress you were keeping for me. I couldn't wear such a tarnished thing now. Kelly screamed, No, 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 Alicia. I love your father. I turned to the manager and said, Does that look like love to you? It sure doesn't to me. He looked at his watch and said, Five minutes left. As I walked out, I made the calls to the locksmith and the security company then the garage door company and told them it was an emergency. They promised it would be done within the hour. I said I would meet them there and headed home. 
At least I had done my part for my father. He deserves a lot better than what Kelly did to him. Giving you back to father now. Now, Michael. I received the video Alicia had shot and was physically sick. Not so much from their screwing but from the put-downs the two of them had made of me, especially by my wife. Or should I say soon to be ex-wife. I called my lawyer and told him to go ahead and start divorce proceedings. He said he had already been forwarded copies of the video and audio that Alicia had sent. He said we'd probably have to sell the house, or I would have to buy her out, and said she would most likely get half of my business. I told him, let her try but didn't elaborate. I completed the tour of Evergreen Industries, and the three of us got together and formulated a report to give to the board. We had decided to keep the Kent, Renton, and Everett facilities and sell off the Tacoma location and move the employees to the other locations or furlough them. It wouldn't be too difficult as a lot of the Tacoma crew had already quit when it was announced that drug and alcohol testing would be required after missed days without a doctor's slip. I had one hell of a time resisting getting shit-faced that evening. Saturday morning, when I got home, I immediately noticed the deep markings on our front door. I rang the bell because my key didn't work and Alicia let me in. She hugged me and handed me my new keys and garage door opener and gave me the new security code. I motioned to the front door and asked, Your mother? Alicia grinned then said, You mean that 304 that you were married to? Yes. She was beating on it with a baseball bat so I called the police. Then she swung it at the officers and they hauled her bum to jail. I don't know when I had such a good laugh. I shook my head at her and I said, You're mean. Just plain mean but I love you for it. You know it? Where would you like to go to dinner? I have a friend I would like you to meet. Alicia giggled and said, You mean Cassie, the one that told mother. I mean Kelly off? I took her in my arms and said, Yes, that Cassie and honey. I know you're upset but she still is your mother and it's okay if you call her that to me. I know you're calling her Kelly to her face just to let her know how pissed off you are with her. Hell so am I but I figured all the yelling, screaming and name calling isn't going to do any good. She's made her bed. Now she gets to lay in it. Right. Alicia buried her head in my chest and hugged the daylights out of me for the longest time. When she finally let go, I asked her, Now baby cakes, where would you like to go to dinner? Alicia got this sly look and said, Delaney's, if that's okay with you. Would you mind if I took one of her dresses to wear tonight? I kept a few that I liked. She had so many, I didn't think she'd miss a few. I really don't have anything classy enough to wear there except my old prom dresses. I nodded and she screamed, yes, as she turned and ran up the stairs to my bedroom. I went into the den and poured myself a drink. Then I called Cassie. Hello there, beautiful. I just got back and I couldn't stop thinking about you. I was wondering if you would care to go out to dinner with Alicia and myself tonight? I asked. Cassie asked, care to tell me what happened with Kelly? I told her not really, but then I told her that Alicia could tell her better that night at dinner. Where are we going so I know how to dress? It'll take me about 10 minutes to get ready. It's nothing fancy. Alicia wants to go to Delaney's if that's alright with you? I told her. Delaney's? Listen, Michael. You'd better give me half an hour, okay? She said a little panicked. No problem. Alicia will probably take longer than that to get ready. I told her. She hung up and I headed upstairs to clean up and make myself presentable. I put on a suit and tie since I figured the girls were going to dress to the nines. I should too. When I finished dressing, I headed downstairs to finish my drink. I had my suit coat draped over the chair and was sitting in the kitchen waiting for Alicia. I heard the clicking of heels on the tile floor and when she walked in, I would have sworn it was Kelly and had trouble swallowing. Her hair was done up like Kelly used to do when we went out for a night on the town pulled up in a comb and water falling down her back, only Alicia was blonde. She was wearing her mother's gray silk wrap dress which clung to her like plastic wrap. The dress clung so tightly to her. She looked at me and asked, What's the matter, Daddy? Don't you like this dress? I had to take a few deep breaths. Tonight was going to be harder than I thought. We drove over to Cassie's and we both got out and rang her bell. When she opened her door, she was wearing a red sequin dress that really did remind me of Jessica Rabbit. I think she stopped my heart. Cassie looked past me and asked, Michael, do you have two dates tonight? Sorry, Cassie, this is my daughter Alicia. Alicia, this is Cassie. I said. Both of the ladies were looking each other up and down then they broke into big smiles and gave each other a big hug. 
Cassie pulled Alicia in and wanted to know everything about how she caught her mother and David. They sat on the couch and Alicia took out her cell phone and played the video for Cassie which seemed to be turning her on. She went into detail about everything that she saw and heard. Finally, I said that we had better be going and ushered the girls out of the door. As we got to the car, Alicia opened the back door and held out her hand, asking for my keys. I said, what do you think you're doing? My sweet daughter said, father, you are on a date with a very beautiful woman and I'm going to chaw for you, so you two climb in back and I will drive. Now Cassie, please enter. She did and Alicia closed the door, then went around and opened the other door for me. She shut it then got in the driver's seat and we went to Delaney's. They have valet parking and she pulled in there and as the one on the restaurant side let Cassie out, you could see that young kid's eyes pop out. But when the other one went to let Alicia out, I thought he was going to stop breathing. Then I remembered that that wrap dress she was wearing. Thought he was watching her as she sauntered across the front of the car, finally remembering to let me out. So I rushed and I took each lady in an arm and the three of us walked into the restaurant. Luckily I had called and made a reservation because there were half a dozen couples waiting for a table. Boy was I getting the looks from both the men and women waiting. I gave the maitre to my name and he took us right in. Upon seeing the ladies, I think they must have drawn straws to see who served us. A very handsome young blonde man ended up as our server. He was probably in his late twenties. He came up and introduced himself as Dane and asked us what we would like to drink. Cassie and I ordered a bottle of Riesling then he turned to Alicia and she said, Dane, I'm driving these two tonight, so I'd better not drink. How about an Arnold Palmer? He smiled at her. I sighed and guessed she was growing up. Something no father likes to see his little girl do. All during dinner, she was obviously flirting with him and he was at our table at least three times as much as any other table he was taking care of. After dinner, we moved to the lounge where the dancing was. Alicia was being bombarded with requests for dances and offers to buy her drinks. Cassie was also being asked to dance, but she didn't want to upset me. I saw her concern and said, Cassie, you are not my exclusive property, not yet anyway. If a guy asks you to dance and you'd like to, go for it girl. I just ask you to look at me first. If I think he's okay, I will give you a slight nod. If I don't, I will take a sip of my drink or ask you to dance myself. Are you okay with that? She smiled and kissed me on the lips. We had a great time and I danced with both Cassie and my daughter. While I was dancing a fairly slow song with Alicia, I said, You sure seem to enjoy flirting with Dane, don't you? You also have gotten a lot of the men in this room quite smitten with you. You know that, don't you? She smirked and said, It's fun, but I'm not married either. Besides daddy, I don't know if he's old enough for me. I looked shocked then she laughed and lightly hit my chest and said, Gotcha. Just then Dane walked up in a dress suit and tie and polished dress shoes and asked Alicia to dance. Her eyes lit up and I extended her hand over to him and she took his and gave me a very big smile as he began to twirl her around the floor. I walked back to our table and waited for Cassie to finish dancing with the guy she was on the dance floor with. When she came back, she gave me a real smoldering kiss, telling me, that was so cool the way you let Alicia go dancing with Dane. I was watching you know. I had seen him watching you too since you guys hit the dance floor. Tell me, how do you feel about your daughter dating someone like him? A slow song started playing and I pulled her out on the dance floor and as we danced cheek to cheek, I told her, even though I'm her father, I have to allow her to grow up to be a woman, to make her own decisions and make her own mistakes. Oh, I will be here to give her advice but will do it only if she asks. I'm not going to preach or beat my values into her. I pray that she turns out to be a fine young adult, wife, and mother, but only time will tell. Cassie held me out at arm's length and said, Mr. Michael Grant, you sir have the wisdom of Solomon. I do believe I am falling in love with you, even though we've only known each other for a short while. She then kissed me deeply, thrusting her tongue far into my mouth. We weren't even keeping tempo with the music. We were just floating around the edge of the dance floor dancing while looking into others' eyes. At midnight Alicia let out a big yawn, as did Cassie so I said, I guess it's time for us to head home, isn't it ladies? They both agreed so we got up. I paid the tab then left to take Cassie home. Cassie and I were in the back seat, making out like a couple of teenagers when I felt my car pulling up a driveway. I looked up and realized it was my driveway, 
especially as the garage door opened and Alicia pulled into the garage. Alicia patted my arm and said, That's okay, Dad. We girls are going to have a sleepover. Is that okay with you? Dad? I thought, Ah, I guess so, Alicia. I just wasn't planning on having my girlfriend stay over at my house this early in our relationship. Cassie shrieked, Girlfriend, as she grabbed both sides of my head and pulled me onto the mother of all kisses, at least the best one that I'd had in years, leaving me breathless. Come on, you two. Get out of that back seat. You're giving me a bad example, she said with a laugh. We got out and went into the kitchen and I asked Cassie if she would like a glass of wine. I don't know why because she and I were already feeling pretty happy, but then Alicia piped up and said, Sure, Daddy. Both of us would enjoy a glass. I'm at home now and can't get in any trouble. I opened a bottle of a sweet Riesling and both ladies loved it. Alicia ran upstairs, came back, and handed Cassie one of my white t-shirts, then the two of them disappeared into Alicia's room. Cassie yelled, Michael, go get your PJs on. We're going to make popcorn and watch a movie and you're joining us. Just before she shut the bedroom door, I went to my room and undressed and slipped on a pair of silk pajamas that Kelly had bought for me for our 15th anniversary, and I think I got to wear them maybe 10 minutes before she was ripping them off of me so she could get into with me. They were washed, dried, put back in their box, and had been on the top of the closet ever since. They were black silk with red piping. I looked at myself in the mirror and wondered if a pipe would make me look more dashing. Then I laughed at myself. That was the booze talking. As I opened my bedroom door, the smell of popcorn came wafting up the stairway. Shit, I couldn't remember how long it had been since there had been popcorn in this house. Kelly had read that microwave popcorn caused cancer so therefore in her mind, all popcorn was bad for us. I walked into the kitchen, following that heavenly smell, and stood mesmerized. Cassie was wearing just my old white t-shirt and a pair of pink lace boy panties. As she shook the popcorn in the pan, Alicia walked in. She took a bowl of butter out of the microwave and brought it over to the table where there was already a large bowl, halfway full of popped corn. Cassie took the pan of the corn she had just popped and added it to the bowl as my daughter poured the butter over it and Cassie stirred it all up. Cassie picked up the bowl and as she headed into the den she said, Michael, want to grab that bottle of wine and maybe another one in a bowl of ice? I nodded. Then we heard a yell from the den. The movie has started. So Alicia quickly headed into her bedroom and came back with a cover-up hiding her outfit. Cassie was sitting in the middle of our big couch with a blanket covering her legs. Alicia crawled under one side and I got in next to Cassie on the other. Cassie had streamed Pride and Prejudice through her Amazon account to our big screen TV. She was holding the bowl of popcorn close to Alicia so I had to reach across her to grab a handful and each time I did. I couldn't help but rub against her without a bit of acknowledgement of my actions. Cassie kept drinking wine and was refilling Alicia's glass every time it was down a little. When Alicia got up to use the bathroom, I whispered to Cassie, Are you trying to get my daughter drunk? She pulled me into a kiss and grinning said, No, Michael. I just want her to sleep soundly so we don't bother her when I drag you to bed and have my way with you. As we watched the movie, Alicia became enthralled watching it. Cassie slipped her hand inside my pajama bottoms and was started teasing me what exquisite torture it was. I wasn't following the movie worth beans, truth be told. Her forecast was spot on as halfway through the movie. Alicia was snoring. Cassie moved the blanket off of us and picked her up and carried her into her bedroom and put her to bed as I folded the blanket, turned off the TV and lights then took the empty wine bottles, glasses, and popcorn bowls into the kitchen. She came up behind me and grabbing my hips, spun me around and pulled my bottoms down to my feet, she gave me a bee job. Kelly hadn't given me head in years. Shit, I couldn't even remember how long ago it was but Cassie was doing everything perfectly. When she removed her lips from mine, she so sexily said, Michael, take me to bed and make love to me. Please. I took her hand and we scurried up the stairs to the master bedroom and in a flash, she tore off the t-shirt and panties. Cassie was incredibly excited to be with me. I was over the moon in ecstasy. If I hadn't already over, I would have blasted off, just entering her. I feel so damn good. I just wish I didn't feel so guilty. Cassie looked at me and asked, What do you have to feel guilty about? I said, Well, technically, I am still married to Kelly. Cassie jumped up and straddled my stomach and pinned my shoulders to the mattress then said firmly, 
Michael Grant, you have nothing to feel guilty about. Your soon-to-be ex-wife made the decision to screw someone else. She stopped loving you some time ago. In her mind, she was no longer married to you. You were just a paycheck to her. Didn't you say that she hadn't made love to you in months? Does that sound like a loving wife? Personally, I think she was out screwing someone else but wanted to try some meat and see if you would okay it and hoped you would become a cuck. So don't you dare feel guilty. I had just had the most intense sexual experience of my life with a woman that could easily have been a playboy or hustler centerfold but in a way, it was a double-edged sword. Having her for a girlfriend was going to be a wild new experience for me, but I had lost the woman that I had loved for most of my life and thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with. Cassie's words hit home, and the reality of it stung. I started to agree with her, but our conversation was interrupted by Alicia, who was standing in the doorway watching us. Walking into the room, she said, Cassie's right, Dad. I don't know if you know or not, but as soon as I turned 16, Mom took me to the doctors and had an IUD put in. Then she took me to lunch, and we had a long talk. She told me that one of her big regrets in life was that she hadn't messed around more with other guys while she was in college, or even while you were stationed far away from her. She said that if I had the opportunity to have sex with a guy that I should experience it before I got tied down. She also told me that I should insist on the guy using a condom because of the possibility of disease. Three months later, I became sexually active and when I told her about it, she made me promise to tell her about every time I was with a boy or man and a few times, while I was telling her, she'd enjoy herself while I did. She was using my sexual activities to fulfill her fantasies only a little over six months ago. She stopped asking. I think she was having an affair with someone starting back then. I pulled up the sheet to cover us and Alicia laughed saying, I've been watching you too for the past half an hour and now you cover up? Get real, dad. Hey Cassie, thanks for taking care of him. You two sure seem to enjoy each other. I looked at my daughter and said, so a few high school boys have made you an expert, huh? Alicia walked over and sat on the edge of the bed and patted my leg and said, yes, dad, a few high school boys, dozens of college boys, two of my teachers, and some of our neighbors. Mom is the one that pushed me into trying the older men. With all the playing I did, I think I can tell when a couple is into each other. I was at a loss for words, but not Cassie. Damn girl, I thought that the five men I've been with was a lot, but you've done enough to write a book. Hell, maybe you should, she said to my daughter, but I was still in shock. My wife had turned my daughter into a 304, and I had no idea. I finally got my voice and said, Alicia, you can't go on like this. You will find yourself unhappy in marriage if you do. I don't know of too many men that will allow their wives to have sex with other men and stay married. Have you thought about that? Of course, Daddy, she said. Next fall, I'm going to college back in Jackson, Tennessee. Aunt Beth lives about a five-minute walk from the college. I know what's in my college fund and since I won't have to worry about room and board, and I'm sure you will let me take my car and pay my insurance, I will have more than enough to pay for my college education and I plan on being a goody two-shoes once I get there. No one there will know my past. I figure I have all my wild side out of me and will not marry until I've been out of school for a few years. Cassie looked at me and said, Michael, you have to admit, she had a good head on her shoulders and has this well thought out. I muttered, all except screwing her teachers, our neighbors, and all those college kids, but it's her life now. Then I said, come here Alicia and give your old fuddy-duddy father a hug. She did and Cassie joined in. Then I asked, Alicia, what did your mother say about messing around with guys in college? My daughter thought for a moment then said, well, I guess I opened my mouth so here goes. Mom was having sex with a few guys when she was in college, but hoped you never found out. Even after she became pregnant. I guess she was screwing that guy that you caught her with, and that scared the shit out of him so much he wouldn't touch her again. She said he had a small tool. She was so pissed at you for scaring him off, that's the reason she wouldn't talk to you for a while. It wasn't grandma like she said it was. I lay there wondering how I could have been so wrong about the woman I loved so much. Was our whole marriage nothing but a sham? Just a joke to her? So I asked her, Alicia, do you know of any affairs she had after that? My daughter shook her head and said, No, daddy. I had my suspicions from time to time, but there was never anything I could prove. There was a couple of times that I came home from school and a strange man was in the house and she passed him off as a repairman or investigator or something. 
I do remember it being funny because once she introduced me to the same guy but she used a different name. When I questioned her about it later, she said that I must have been mistaken. So I believe she was cheating on you all along. It's just nothing that I can prove. In divorce court, Kelly was fighting the divorce. Her argument was that she still loved me and her one indiscretion shouldn't really affect our marriage. It was just something she had to get out of her system and she had planned on coming back and going on with her normal life. Then her lawyer called Kelly's therapist and she testified that I should be more understand of Kelly's needs, that I should forgive her and take her back. After she has been a wonderful wife to me for over 20 years and now I wanted to throw it all away. She pointed her finger at me and said, Shame on you, Michael Grant. The judge told her to control herself or face contempt of court charges. Her lawyer called her former employer, Dr. Penrose, who testified that Kelly was a great nurse and was one of his best surgical assistants he ever had. Then our lawyer asked him if he had ever been propositioned by Kelly, and he told him that he hadn't. He was then released. Then our lawyer called up Lori Penrose, his wife. Kelly's lawyer objected, and the judge overruled his objection. Our lawyer asked her, Mrs. Penrose, did you ever have an occasion to have suspicions that Kelly Grant wanted to seduce your husband, Dr. Penrose? Mrs. Penrose turned and glared at Kelly and said to him, Yes. On several occasions when I was supposed to be out of the office, she would come to work wearing very short skirts or blouses without wearing a bra. She would try to get my husband to take her out to lunch and make sexual innuendos while they worked. My husband is too nice a guy to say anything bad about Kelly, but others working in our office told me about what was going on. When I confronted my husband, he admitted it but did say he had never done anything with her and claimed it was just some harmless flirting. What she was doing was far beyond harmless if you ask me. One of the other nurses said that she often went out with the pharmaceutical representatives for long lunches if you get my drift. Then Kelly's lawyer asked to cross her and he smugly asked, Mrs. Penrose, did you actually see Mrs. Grant improperly dressed and come on to your husband? or go out to lunch with one of the pharmaceutical representatives. She smiled at him and said, Sir, I never caught her coming on to my husband but yes, I did on a few occasions come into the office when I had planned on being off and found her dressed improperly and a couple of times when she came back from a long lunch with one of the reps, she looked like she had been in bed with them. Her hair and makeup were a mess and she would rush to the bathroom and fix herself up. I never said anything to her because I didn't feel it was any of my business if she was a cheating 304 or not. The judge asked her to please watch her language and she nodded and asked Kelly's lawyer, Any further questions, counselor? He shook his head no so the judge released her. Then it was our turn. My lawyer called Alicia. First Alicia testified about finding strange men at times when she got home from school and the time she introduced the same man only used a different name. Then to the fact that her mother had taken her down to her doctor's and had her get an IUD within a few days of her turning 16 then took her to lunch and told her how she regretted not having sex with more guys both before and after she married her father. Alicia said that left her in shock. She also told her that older guys tend to make better lovers, not old. Old but say, 30 to 45 or so. Then she told her that she should always use condoms too, just in case and to prevent disease. She told the court that it took her three months to build up the courage to allow a boy to go all the way with her, and when she told her mother that she had gone all the way, her mother wanted to know every detail and made Alicia promise to tell her about every time she was with someone, and often her mother would enjoy herself while Alicia was relating her story to her mother. She said that it was getting more and more frequent, but about six months before she caught her in bed with David, she stopped asking for information when she got home from a hot date. Alicia said, I know I can't prove it but her changes in attitude. It made me think that she was having an affair. It was just something in the way she behaved and smiled to herself all the time, but not when my father was around. Then the judge asked her if she would tell him the names of the teachers or our neighbors she played with. She said, Your Honor, I respectfully decline as I was the one that instigated our tryst. I don't feel prosecuting any of these men or breaking up their marriages would be the right thing to do. Then she asked if she could show the video of her going into the hotel room and the judge allowed it. On condition, all the visitors left the courtroom, over the screams from Kelly and objections from her lawyer. My lawyer controlled the remote and he stopped it and replayed the parts where either Kelly or David were cutting me down. Kelly kept telling David how much better his huge tool felt and couldn't see herself going back to Michael's little tool again. 
There were several others' jibes being said as Alicia and the hotel manager walked in on them. They were so busy going at it, they never noticed the two of them videoing them. Then my lawyer let the video play out. He released Alicia, and to my and everyone else's surprise, he called a Mrs. Jeffries. I saw Kelly's mouth drop open, and her lawyer stood and objected because he said that he hadn't been made aware of this witness being called. My lawyer explained that Mrs. Jeffrey had just come to him this morning with some information that she felt was important to his client's case. The judge allowed her to testify. My lawyer asked her what her full name was, and when she said, Louise Marie Jeffrey, or Mrs. Dr. Martin Jeffrey, whichever you prefer. I looked over at Kelly and her mouth was wide open and she looked scared shitless. She quickly whispered something to her lawyer, and again he objected. Again the judge overruled him and told my lawyer to go ahead with Mrs. Jeffrey. He said, Now Mrs. Jeffrey, you have been sworn in to tell the truth, is that correct? She nodded and he said, Please speak up so the court can hear you, and please tell the court in your own words why you contacted me this morning. She said, Yes sir. I will tell the truth and the reason I contacted you because I happened to hear that Kelly was contesting the divorce on the grounds that she loved her husband and that her affair was a one-time dalliance. My lawyer said, Mrs. Jeffrey, do you have something to say or any evidence to say otherwise that this wasn't a one-time fling? She gave Kelly a dirty look and said, Yes, Mr. Brawley. I know for a fact that it wasn't the first time she had cheated. She was having an affair with my husband for nearly six months before she was caught in flagrante delicto with her lover, Dr. Patterson. I turned over to you the videos my private investigator took of the two of them on multiple occasions, if you doubt my word. My attorney turned and asked the judge if he could show the evidence and before the judge could answer, Kelly's lawyer objected. The judge just shook his head and said, Sit down, counselor. I want to see this and if I decide it doesn't pertain to this case. I will approve your objection. Then he turned to my lawyer and said, Shall we proceed, Mr. Brawley? My lawyer hit the remote and on the screen flashed pictures of Kelly with this older gentleman sneaking into storage rooms at the hospital, then coming out 45 minutes to an hour later, their clothes disheveled. Then there were several of them in different hotels with them doing the horizontal mambo, only it wasn't always just horizontal. Kelly was quite the contortionist, only I never knew it. Then there was the part of where Dr. Jeffrey brought in two other men, and the three of them took on Kelly all at once. That set Kelly over the edge and she started screaming, Stop it! God damn it! Please just stop that damn thing! All right, so I'm human and I had needs. Then she turned to me and said, But Michael, I still loved only you. Can't you understand that and forgive me? The judge banged his gavel, and even though he said it under his breath to his clerk, you could still make out, she calls that love? Most of those in attendance broke into laughter. The video continued, then it showed the P.I. following Kelly. She was going to a hotel with David Patterson two weeks before she was caught. It also showed her going over to his townhouse early in the morning, so they could have sex in the bedroom and kitchen before they left, and met at the little restaurant where I caught up with them. The video showed at least a six times my wife had been with the good doctor, screwing him behind my back. I shook my head in disgust at her. Kelly turned red in the face and slumped back into her chair. My lawyer asked Mrs. Jeffrey, Have you divorced Dr. Jeffrey? She smiled and said, Oh, heavens no. But he is paying handsomely. As one hand held up the large, beautiful diamond necklace from between her large aftermarket breasts, and she held out her other hand with a huge diamond ring. She elaborated, He wasn't following our prenup, and now I've taken measures to ensure he doesn't stray again. My lawyer released her, and as she left the witness stand, Cassie pointed out to me her golden chain bracelet with a small gold key. I asked her what was the big deal with that key. Cassie smiled and whispered in my ear, She has put his tool in a cage, and that's the key to it. I winced at the mental vision. Then the judge said since Kelly made a very good income as a surgical nurse, there would be no spousal aid but she would have to pay child support because he had talked to Alicia and she wanted to stay with me and I would continue to stay in the home with my daughter until she finished school and that meant college. Also, after Alicia finished college, I was to sell the house and the proceeds divided four ways equally between Kelly, me, and the kids. Then the judge started to talk about my business and my lawyer produced the documents that I had sold the company and Kelly just about climbed over her lawyer to get at me. The judge looked the paperwork over and said, Seems legal to me so I guess there's nothing to split. You each get to keep your I.RAS and retirement 
But Mr. Grant has petitioned the court for you, Mrs. Grant to give up your last name and go back to your maiden name which I agree with. He also has asked for a one-year restraining order barring you from coming within 1,000 feet of his workplace or your former home or to follow him and bother him while he is out in public. Do I make myself perfectly clear? The officer you hit with the baseball bat is still on light duty and if you violate these orders, you will find yourself in jail for a minimum of a year, understood? I hereby grant the petitioner's desire for divorce. Sixty days from today your divorce will be final. Please come forward and sign these documents and the clerk will take you to the records department so they can be filed. Kelly was totally pissed was refusing to sign so the judge said, Kelly James, would you like to spend 90 days in jail for contempt of court? So she signed. As soon as the judge left for his chambers and the clerk took our papers to the recorder's office, she began calling out to me saying, Michael, I still love you. Please, can't you forgive me? Michael? My lawyer ushered us out a side door and down a less public corridor and out the back entrance. Alicia and I got home and I got out of my suit and into some comfortable sweats. When I came down, my daughter had poured me a tall glass of bourbon and coke. Damn, I needed that. The doorbell rang and she went to answer it and welcomed Cassie in. Alicia fixed her a glass of wine and we took our drinks to my bedroom while my daughter ordered pizza for our dinner. Cassie and I ate cold pizza late that night. Cassie and I dated hot and heavy for a couple of months before she asked me one night if I had given a thought to us getting married. This was preceded by a mind-blowing evening of sexual treats. I acted like I was in shock and was stretching and stuck my hand under my pillow and pulled out the little black velvet box and handed it to her. I had been planning on this for weeks now. Cassie's eyes went wide and she said, Michael, if I open this and there's not a ring in there, you know I may go all Lorena Bobbitt on you, don't you? I smiled and said, my love, I'm willing to take that chance. When she opened the box, I'm sure her shrill squeal of joy could be heard blocks away. I know my ears sure rang for minutes afterwards. Cassie was smothering me with kisses then I pulled away from her for a bit. I rolled over and reached between the mattresses. I pulled out our itinerary to Hedonism 2 in Negril, Jamaica where I had reserved the honeymoon cottage for two weeks and also arranged for an evening beachside wedding with a beachside dinner for us and local DJ to help us celebrate our wedding. If other guests wanted to join, the more the merrier, I figured. Cassie gave me this pensive look but smiled. Besides, this gives me less than a month to get a dress, figure out what to pack, notify my boss, update my passport, and... My kiss silenced her, then rubbing her nose with mine. I said, My darling, you know that sheer white nightgown I bought you last month? That's what I want you to wear when we get married. Unless you find something you'd rather wear. I thought I'd wear some white nylon board shorts and a bow tie. We'll both be barefoot since I believe we'll be standing at the water's edge. Just think of how sexy those wedding pictures will be for us to look back at. I grabbed her hand and kissed it, then said, Listen my love, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just saying let's go get married down there. Breakfast is ready, Michael, said Cassie. She took off her apron and sat across from me while we ate and once we were finished, I said, My love, once we're married, I would like it if you did not go back to work. We just sort of retired. I have been offered a very nice sum for the business and have signed their offer. I figured once we're back, we could sell one or both of our places and buy a nice motor coach and travel for a while and find a place that we would really like to spend the rest of our lives living together there. What would you say to that? She stood up, walked over to me so I scooted my chair back and she sat in my lap and put her arms around my neck and giving me a smile that filled my heart with joy said, Michael, at times I wish we could have met sooner but then we wouldn't have appreciated one another as much as we do now. You are the most wonderful man a woman could ever want. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Just remember, we still need some outside interests, so it's got to be someplace close enough for us to enjoy the things both of us like to do. I want us to be happy, but if we're tied together 24-7, I'm pretty sure our attitude will change. Tell me, what would you like to do? What hobbies do you have, or what would you like to do once you're retired? I already knew that answer and said, I want to rebuild muscle cars, you know the high-performance cars from the mid-60s to early 70s. Tear them apart and make them just like new or even better, then we could go to car shows or just take a drive around town or out in the country. I loved working on cars when I was in high school with my Uncle Dave. So what would you like to do? Cassie bashfully said, 
I hope you don't think it's silly, but I would love to take up painting again. I had started when I was in college. I'd go out and take a bunch of pictures of something or someone I wanted to paint, then I would attach the pictures all around the easel and begin painting. By the time I graduated, I was getting pretty good. At least I thought so. So I entered a local art exhibition. Of my five entries, one got a second place and one a fourth. But once I started working, then meeting my future husband, there never seemed to be enough time for me to go back to what I really love doing. I guess we have a deal, Michael said with smile. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.